the CTC staff, which I believe is the hardest working staff in the state. During the pandemic, we never missed a meeting. We may have held it virtually, but we never missed a meeting. And despite the fact that we gave more people during the pandemic longer deadlines in which to fill out the applications for grants for all of our programs, the CTC staff held itself to the deadlines that were published so that we could make sure that we distributed funds for all of the programs that we said we would. Um, since SB1 began, that means we have distributed $30 billion worth of funding. And we're very, very excited that we are continuing our goals to make sure that we can invest SB1 dollars in the projects that are gonna mean the most to the state and make sure that we hire people, that we move people, and that we make sure we have equity and safety in this state. And I just wanna, before we do anything, have us all give a round of applause to the CTC staff and how hardworking you have been these last two years. Before I have Doug uh, call the roll, we are gonna have to do things a little differently since we are here and we have new ways of voting and some other ways of speaking in this room. I need you all to raise your hand. It's gonna feel like we're back in school, but it will help if you raise your hand, especially if you're the maker of the motion and a seconder of the motion, because what I'm gonna do, since we no longer are gonna have um, voice votes, I'm gonna recognize the mover and the seconder, and then I will call the roll. So I wanna make sure that we do that so that everybody who's listening also is very clear as to who's moved and seconded motions and how our votes are going. But in addition, I want to make sure that we raise our hands when we want to speak because I, I would like to call on you all by name. So um, that's just a new wrinkle, but one worth having in order for us to see each other in person, which is so exciting. And with that, Douglas, could you please call the roll? Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioner Alvarado. Yes, sir. Commissioner Davis. Here. Yeah. Commissioner Eager. Here. Yeah. Commissioner Falcone. Here. Yeah. Commissioner Grisby. Here. Commissioner Guardino. Present. Commissioner Inman. Here. Commissioner Liu. Here. Commissioner Martinez. Present. Commissioner Tabaloni. Chair Norton. Present. Senator Newman. Assemblymember Friedman. Madam Chair, we have a quorum. Thank you so much. Uh, with that, could you please read the instructions for the public to participate in our meeting today? Yes, Madam Chair. Welcome to the December 2021 CTC meeting. For those participating online, please note that because this is a two-day meeting, you will need to use a separate link to attend the meeting tomorrow. The links can be found on the first page of the meeting agenda. You may also use the questions tab on the webinar if you have questions about this. The commission's agenda is located under the handouts tab as well as on our website. Live closed captioning and American Sign Language translations are being provided on the webinar for this meeting. You can access these services through links found on our commission meetings page. For those on the webinar, you should be able to see the American Sign Language Translation on the cameras. For our presenters, if you're on the agenda to make a presentation, please do your best to be succinct. Please remember to speak at a steady pace to allow our translating services mm -hmm. adequate time for accurate translation. If you are presenting remotely, we hope that you will turn on your camera during your presentation, if you have one. For the members of the public, we welcome comments from the public as a part of each item at this meeting. For those attending here in person, please submit a speaker slip to the clerk, which is me, to the front of the room. Indicate on here which item you're trying, you would like to make a comment on. For those attending via GoToWebinar, you should see the webinar control panel likely located on the right-hand side of your screen. There you will find the raise hand feature as well as the questions tab. We encourage you to use the raised hand feature as early into the item as you can to give the system time to acknowledge you. Alternately, you may use the questions tab to submit your comment. Please be sure to include the agenda item number you are commenting on. Commissions and commission staff will read the comment on your behalf. 
As a reminder, each registered attendee has provided a unique link and a phone number to access the webinar. These should not be shared with other participants as they are registered to a specific attendee and can create confusion for staff when making comments. For all of our participants, please do your best to be concise with your comments. Please make sure that your comments add new information. If you agree with the comments of a previous speaker, simply make that statement. Please also remember to speak at a steady pace to allow our translating services adequate time for, for accurate translations. Since we often have many speakers, we ask that you make your point in three minutes or less. If for some reason we have many speakers on the topic, we reserve the right to limit this comments to one minute as needed if the chair indicates. Attendees participating remotely will not be able to attend, will not be able to be on camera while making their comments. Thank you all for joining us today. We know your time is valuable and we appreciate you sharing some of it with us. Thank you so much, Douglas. And we will have a, a two phase um, indicator of public comment. We'll have, Justin will give me an idea of public comment in the room and also if we have public comment coming up from remote. So thank you very much. I wanna thank you all for being here in person, but also we were very pleased over these last two years to have an extraordinary number of people really count on us to have these meetings remotely. So I wanna thank the staff for doing this wonderful hybrid meeting. And with that, we'd like to invite Jan Hammett Harnick, from the RTC, RCTC chair, to give us a welcome to the region. Good afternoon, Chair Horton. Good afternoon. And commissioners. Uh, as chair of RCTC, and on behalf of my fellow commissioners, I'm excited the CTC for your first live meeting is here in Riverside County. And all of us acknowledge and are so thankful for Commissioner Joe Tavalonis lifetime commitment to transportation infrastructure from which the entire Inland Empire has been benefited so greatly. RCTC is working on mobility solutions that will connect our communities and provide options that promote equity and economic prosperity, reduce traffic congestion, and secure a climate resilient future for the region. RCTC focuses to provide our residents with mobility choices from passenger rail services and rideshare programs to express bus services and tolled facility options. RCTC is working to deliver projects that meet our residents' needs. RCTC has invested over $2 billion in tolled express rail lanes on the 91 and 15 alone, reinforcing our regional backbone. But our work focuses on the future too. We are planning next generation projects while conserving land and habitat to establish Riverside County as the leading example of sustainable planning. And this requires a just transition for communities coping with decades of underinvestment in their transportation infrastructure. Our region faces challenges implementing new transportation policies, but the fact of the matter is we must be forward thinking. We must be transformational. We cannot afford to think incrementally. We have all learned that we must apply solutions in alignment with the diversity of each region. This is increasingly important as the region continues to rely on this area for desperately needed housing and solutions won't be easy. Rail and bus transit were hit hard by COVID, van pool and rideshare too. Metrolink ridership has doubled from this time last year, but it is still 70% lower than pre-pandemic levels. For bus transit operat operations, ridership is moving up, but it is still 58% lower than pre-pandemic levels. Traffic is clearly back, but as passengers are slow to return to transit, we need to continue to work hard with our partners to emphasize the importance of transit, to restore transit availability, rider confidence, and safety to ensure it serves all of our populations, especially those in disadvantaged communities. These modes are important to future mobility in the region, and this is a window of opportunity for us. As I testified at the recent, recent ITIP hearing, our commission unanimously supported passenger rail service between the Coachella Valley and Los Angeles. This is the kind of once in a generation transformational project that will change the region's connectivity, reduce carbon emission, and enhance future economic prosperity and quality of living for generations to come. 
Our region doesn't just move people, it also moves goods. Our investments support the supply chain and goods movement economy that benefit all of California and in fact, the entire nation. 40% of the nation's goods travel through the Inland Empire by truck and train. This impacts every resident in Riverside County and their quality of living. And we are looking at creative ways to make it better. We are as proud of our progress and projects as we are of our vision. We have been a solutions-based leader in transportation for decades, but our local sales tax, Measure A, cannot fund the state's transportation goals alone. To be successful, the state must join in, in true partnership, to ensure the Inland Empire, the fastest growing region in our state, isn't left behind and can reach its potential in future-facing and innovative ways that will benefit us all and avoid the predictable pitfalls of doing business as usual. This past weekend, Governor Newsom held a press conference on I-15 near state line at the California-Nevada border. He stated there was a deep urgency for fixing the border bottleneck between the states. I applaud the governor. We've all been caught in that at one time, I know. <laughs> for stepping in and accelerating additional capacity on that corridor. I would also encourage the governor to step in right here at home in our Riverside County mm -hmm. to provide relief to the hardworking people of the Inland Empire who suffer each and every day on I-15 and I-10. Mm -hmm. We have a deep urgency for funding, environmental streamlining, supply chain relief, and congestion mitigation that could use your Let's work to get something done approach. I want to express our CTC sincere gratitude to the CTC for supporting our projects. And I look forward to a stronger partnership in the future. Please let's build bold, bold together. I now invite my colleague at SBCTA, San Bernardino County Supervisor, and SBCTA Board President, Kurt Hagman, to provide additional opening remarks from our region. Thank you so much. Thank you for your very insightful remarks. Good afternoon, everybody. It's great to welcome you here to IE, and it's great to see smiling faces in person. <laughs> um, it seems like a lot of those first times here in the last few months for all of us, and it's great to be back out. And I want to welcome you to the IE, which we are the, the fastest growth area in the United States. So we've been told, and we know we are for the epicenter for California at this point. So we're excited to be here. I'm, I'm, thank you for the opportunity to share a few things about San Bernardino County, both the excitement that we have here, but also some of the challenges we face going forward. I uh, first want to start off with our trains and Metrolink section. Um, just last week, we got our first new DMU rail that was delivered and will begin testing over the next several months um, for our stops in um, on Metrolink in San Bernardino. And we'll add five stops going from downtown San Bernardino to University of Redlands with service beginning this summer, this summer of 2022. So we're excited about that. <laughs> Currently, we're developing the North America's first self-powered, zero-emission multiple unit, or we call it ZMU. Uh, and those rail vehicles will be operating the Redlands Rail in a little more than two years. So we've really got exciting technology coming to San Bernardino County. SBCTA is also working with Brightline, that's the high-speed rail uh, company that can connect Las Vegas to um, Apple Valley and down to Home Pass to Ranch Cucamonga, a Metrolink station there. So we're excited about that. And lastly, we're also dealing with the Boring Company to build California's first underground tunnel from the Metrolink station at Ranch Cucamonga to Ontario International Airport, which I'm very excited for the new technology that's shown there. They're doing their um, research development out of San Bernardino County, although the Las Vegas that beat us to the first tunnel made. But um, we're looking forward to that technology as a future infrastructure tool in our toolbox. Our commuting trends, some of our challenges, our region is unique that offers many Southern California residents more affordable um, housing options than our coastal counterparts. Unfortunately, from a transportation perspective, the bulk of the job centers remain in Los Angeles and Orange counties. Um, commuters may travel up to 75 miles each day from home to work. Um, in I-10 Western Region alone, we have over 300,000 trips daily on the I-10. We have about similar on the I-210 and I-60 as well. And we all know about the goods movement at this point. Um, our region is confronted with the expanding goods movement industry from the ports of Long Beach and LA. We heard that more than 50% of the cargo arriving at those ports go through San Bernardino County, and nearly 70% of those goods arrive on trucks. So it's already impacting our very heavily used freeways. Um, we're 
tasked with finding solutions um, with this going forward. And we believe that strategic investments into freight corridors are among some of the answers to, and we hope that you guys share that goal of finding those solutions to move that cargo. I think it's a national importance at this point. Yep. Um, buses, we all heard about the hit that we all took during the pandemic. We're down, uh, we used to have 11 million trips per year. We're down to about 65% when COVID hit, and we're back up um, roughly about still 60% off today. So that's still going to take a while for that to recover. I do sit on that board as well, Omnitrans, and we know we're working on different ways to try and increase ridership in our public transportation. But of all those challenges, I believe we have a great team. We're working with you, our counterparts, RCTC, and um, other committees. I also sit on SCAG Transportation, was the former transportation chair there. There's solutions in there. I know if your investment and the strategic time that the federal government's investing with us as well, if we work together, we come up with solutions for some of our challenges, but we're excited about the opportunities of the future. And I really want to thank you for joining us here in the IE today. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Are there any other people who want to um, give welcoming comments today? And commissioners, are there any other comments that you'd want to make on the what's been said? Commissioner Inman. I don't know how to turn my mic on anymore. So um, I'm just thankful that we're all here. And I think for all of us, our extended transportation family, what we learned during COVID was how much we missed coming together. And we did the best we could. Uh, and thank heavens for technology, but I, I just want to say it's great to be back to almost normal, and I can't wait till we get to uh, full-fledged normal, but uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, we thank you very much for that wonderful welcome, and we are going to take two action items. Uh, first is the approval of the minutes, and second is the commissioner meetings for compensation, which we can take together, correct, Douglas? If you if you like that, we can yes certainly. Yes, um, could we have a motion for motion items for three Martinez. and four? Commissioner Martinez, you have a second. Co Commissioner Inman, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, any abstentions or noes? Wonderful. That now takes us to item five. Commission Executive Director Mitch Weiss. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as I think uh, most of you are, I'm happy to be here in person and happy to be holding today's meeting, uh, both in person and with the virtual option for participation. It's great to see everybody who join, join, are joining us in person. It's been nearly two years since we last met in person and the majority of uh, the commissioners haven't had the opportunity to meet together like this before. I also wanna recognize our virtual attendees, including Commissioner Davis, uh, even though you're not here in person, your participation is just as important. Looking ahead, we plan to hold our January meeting using the same hybrid format with both with the in-person location being in Sacramento or the Sacramento area. Uh, this will, of course, be subject to state and local public health guidance in effect at the time. On today's agenda, we'll be requesting your approval of the Commission's 2021 annual report to the legislature. This report highlights our accomplishments during 2021 and makes recommendations for the coming year. In 2021, we allocated more than $7 billion, creating over 79,000 jobs. We maintained our focus on Fix It First projects, along with projects that advance our equity and climate change goals. We adopted a racial equity statement that acknowledges the historical and present racial inequities in the transportation sector and outlines our commitment to addressing racial inequities in our work moving forward. We initiate, initiated our equity advisory roundtable and are working with Caltrans and CalSTA to launch a series of listening sessions in 2022. Getting this much accomplished on equity in one year was not an easy feat. I'm proud of our team for making it happen. Um, as Governor Newsom has said, if leaders are going to meet this moment, each and every one of us has to do more and do better. But this has been a, a significant strain on our planning team in particular, who have statutory requirements in the transportation planning area that we must fulfill. Therefore, I will be working with the administration and the legislature uh, to get new positions so that we continue, can continue this critical equity work without impacting our statutory workload. 
In 2021, we also continued our work to enhance climate considerations in our programs and policies. We endorse the Climate Action Plan for Transportation Infrastructure. We're currently holding program workshops to update our guidelines and including how we will be addressing the CAPTI in there. We've been working with the Department of Housing and Community Development to see how their new pro-housing designation for local governments can fit into our program guidelines. Um, I'd also like to highlight some things related to transportation funding. In 2021, we worked with the legislature and Senator Weiner in particular to get Senate Bill 339 passed. The, this bill implements uh, one of our recommendations to conduct a new road charge pilot program to test revenue collection. With the increase in zero emission vehicle sales expected in the coming years, this pilot will keep California's road charge efforts moving forward and help make sure we're ready for implementation when it's necessary. We're already working on SB 339 pilot program. In October 20, on October 29th, staff presented an implementation plan to the commission's road charge technical advisory committee. Uh, unfortunately, in this area, we can only do so much to implement the bill at our current resource level. I'll be working with the administration and the legislature to ensure that we have adequate staff and resources uh, to make sure and really ensure that we have adequate levels to make this effort a success. Also in 2021, we advocated for increased funding for the active transportation program. While this effort was not successful, our effort brought a renewed focus on the tremendous backlog of active transportation program projects and the significant need to increase funding for this program. Following the commission's actions in October, we began reaching out to the legislature and the administration to pursue both a $2 billion augmentation from the general fund surplus for the active transportation program and a $2.5 billion augmentation from the general fund surplus to fund transit projects in the STIP. And in the last year, we worked along Caltrans and CalSTA to promote California's priorities for federal infrastructure legislation. With the passage of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act on November 15th, we're beginning work on implementation of this long overdue boost in federal transportation funding. We're still reviewing the programmatic requirements and awaiting FHWA's guidance on the individual programs. We'll be reporting back in January with more detailed information. Uh, lastly, I would like to note that we'll be having a handful of workshops between now and our January meeting focused on program guideline development for our competitive programs. This includes a December 16th workshop on incorporating transportation equity across our SB1 competitive programs. That concludes my reports. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Commissioners or uh, Senator Newman, do you have any questions of Executive Director Weiss? Thank you very much for your report. <clears throat> With that, we'll move on to um, item six, which is commissioner reports. And the most important commissioner here is uh, Commissioner Joe Tavaloni, because anytime we're in Riverside, we really need to be uh, welcomed by you. So, Commissioner Tavaloni, I just want to give you the floor to say a few words about this wonderful city that is your home. Wow. Um, I hope there's a technician in here who can tell me how to operate this. Uh, You're doing fine. You're mic'd up. Is that on? Yep. Oh, well, I lucked out. Well, welcome, all of you. Um, First of all, I want to want to thank uh, Ann Mayor for uh, putting this part of the commission meeting together. Uh, it's probably one of the nicest that we are able to meet in. We have lots of room. And secondly, I think this meeting means a lot to me because all I've been able to hear for the last couple of years is voices and a face, but never a handshake or a kiss on the cheek. And I haven't got slapped yet so far today, <laughs> but Riverside has been doing this now for roughly as long as I've been on the commission. I'm not, I'm not counting days, but somewhere in the neighborhood of 
20 years or so and and the mission inn has always graciously helped us put uh, dinners together and and uh, usually we have a great time and and we have it's the commission to me has been a family we operate kind of like a family if if we've had a problem somebody is always there to help the other one uh, settle whatever problems there might be and we had very 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 few of them but riverside really really welcomes all of you here and i just wish that we could have more meetings here more than one meeting a year but uh, uh, other areas need to see us uh, also so i want to thank all of you for being here today and thank all of the commissioners and i haven't shaken hands i don't think with each and every one of them uh, i don't like the word new commissioners but uh, the ones that i haven't met yet and and uh, this is a great day for me to meet all of you and and uh, shake your hand and hopefully give you a little kiss on the cheek and and say welcome and welcome all of you to riverside and the mission in and the lights and hopefully uh, you have a great time for the next couple of days thank you thank you so much and thank you for being such a wonderful ambassador for riverside always um today i wanted to in my remarks present two very important items one is a resolution and i want to read that resolution to you and this resolution is to caltrans on march 19th 2020 in response to the growing COVID-19 pandemic, Governor Gavin Newsom issued Executive Order N3320, ordering all individuals living in the state of California to stay home except as needed to maintain continuity of operations of federal critical infrastructure sectors, including the transportation system sector. And whereas many of the Caltrans, California Department of Transportation's 21,000 employees were able to successfully transition to working remotely in compliance with the governor's executive order. And whereas to ensure the continued operations of California's transportation systems, the department staff across all programs, including employees in the divisions of maintenance and the division of construction, continued to perform their duties in the field in all 12 districts with sacrifice to themselves and their families to serve the people of California. And whereas the Department of Transportation's frontline employees enable to safeguarding the well-being of the people of the state of California, and whereas the ability to travel safely on California's roadways was crucial as essential workers needed to get to their jobs, people needed quick access to hospitals and clinics, and goods needed to reach new destinations as people were ordered to stay home. And whereas without the efforts of the California Department of Transportation's frontline employees, the state's ability to respond to the widespread public health crisis posed by the COVID-19 pandemic would have been seriously compromised. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the California Transportation Commission extends to the California Department of Transportation's frontline employees its commendation and appreciation for continuing to serve the people of the state of California and ensure the safety of the traveling public throughout the unprecedented challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic. Can we please have someone from um, Caltrans come and receive this resolution? Station right there. Yeah. Okay. And then I'd like one with the other commissioners to join us. 
Where are we going? Yeah. 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 Okay, Richard, can you join us? And Joe, let's have you in the front. Yes. Oh. Yeah. 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 One, two, three. One, two, three. Should we get Chief Deputy Director Keever as well? Chief Deputy Director Keever. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Thank you. So now that um, we're all in the picture, we're going to need a motion to move approval of the resolution. So I heard uh, Commissioner Liu move approval and Commissioner Inman second. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, any opposed? Any abstention? Wonderful. Um, the Caltrans, we really appreciate your heroic efforts and continued heroic efforts as COVID-19's pandemic is not done. Um, and we wanted to also recognize a CTC staff member that was also incredibly heroic during this time. And that is Denise Mitchell. So I'd like to read this letter from us. Um, to honor you with gratitude for your COVID-19 contact tracing efforts. Dear Denise, on behalf of the California Transportation Commission, I would like to offer you the commission's commendation and appreciation for your contributions to California Connected, the state's comprehensive COVID-19 contact tracing program and public awareness campaign. When it became clear that contact tracing would be a vital tool in helping California limit new cases of COVID-19, the California Department of Public Health determined that 10,000 contact tracers were needed to support state and local health departments. To support this effort, all state departments were required to redirect 5% of their employees to temporary assignments as contact tracers. You rose to the moment by volunteering to step away from your existing role and take on the vital responsibility of contact tracing to strengthen California's pandemic response. The duties you performed were essential and helped to mitigate the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. You have served the people of the state of California admirably throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, working to ensure their safety. And for this, the commission is extremely grateful. Thank you very much, Denise. Denise is not here oh. to um, receive this commendation, but we hope she is watching as we're awarding it to oh, her. I, I'm I'm here. I just turned. It. <laughs> I I just have to say thank you very much. It it was a hard year for everyone, and just being part of 
um, helping others, but it was a very extremely hard year because we had to deal with a lot of people and stories that they've told us about COVID. And COVID is, it, it, it also, um, we lost a family member recently because of COVID. He was in the hospital since August. So I just, you know, I just thank you. It means a lot. And I just dedicate this to our family member that just recently passed away. So, so thank you. Thank you so much, Denise. One more round of applause for you. I have just a few additional remarks and then I would like to recognize one of my colleagues. Um, during this time, I spoke a little bit about, I think really the heroism of much of our staff and the work that has been done, especially with the active transportation program. We had communities that were really compromised trying to just make sure that we, they could continue operations and yet they were applying for very, very important programs for active transportation. The CTC staff did hundreds of site visits, worked with so many communities, and has done such a great job in making sure that people could have access to this important safety and zero emission travel option. During COVID-19, I think we all became more and more aware of the importance of us being able to walk safely, bike safely, and travel safely. And that is why we have put forth this motion. I want to thank my colleague, um, Bob Alvarado, our vice chair, for putting in the motion to ask for $2 billion in active transportation projects from the general fund. And one of the most important things we've been talking to people about and hearing from the community is half a billion dollars we're requesting for bike corridors. The reason is so many more people are wanting to bike. So many more people like Commissioner Inman are using electric bikes and we wanna make sure that we're creating safe opportunities for biking, safe opportunities for us to travel in zero emission and travel safely. And in addition, Another motion that was made that our director Weiss referred to was the two and a half billion dollars we're asking for in the STIP for transit funds so that we can have more funding for buses along our freeway network and in other corridors. These are so important to us as we are moving towards those CAPTI goals of reduced emissions and reduced driving. And so I really look forward to the conversations we're having with more of our state legislative colleagues. And I wanna thank Senator Newman for your interest and your advocacy for this very, very important motion. Thank you so much. Um, with that, I want to recognize my colleague, uh, Bob Alvarado, our vice chair for a special announcement. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as some of you know, I retired from my day job in August. And I thought uh, long and hard about uh, the commission. I've enjoyed immensely my time here. Um, I've got some surgery coming up on my eye and <clears throat> not sure if I'm gonna be able to make the January meeting. So I wanna take this opportunity to just let everybody know that I did not uh, seek to extend my term on the commission. Um, I wanna thank my fellow commissioners um staff i mean literally the best of the best i've been here since 2006 served on several state boards and commissions and and nobody even comes close uh, to the quality and the quantity of the work that they produce made a lot of friends uh, local agencies and the stakeholders that come to all these meetings um you know when when you're <clears throat> when you sit up here um they're, you know, doing the work that you do, you, you make a lot of acquaintances. Uh, but this is a special place. I made a lot of friends. And I really appreciate the fact that, uh, that you're there every time uh, we ask you to speak or you come to us with, a, with an issue and help us solve it. And, and that's the main thing about this industry is nobody comes crying and whining without a solution. And that sure makes everybody's job uh, a lot easier. We put thousands of folks to work. I mean, literally thousands of folks went to work uh, because of the actions of this commission. 
I'm very proud of the Caldecott Tunnel. And uh, for you folks in Solano, uh, that 86, 80, 12 is a dream come true. Not all the way done yet, but it's literally a dream come true. Um, the commissioner whose place I took on this commission spent four years and never approved a project. Um, one of the reasons I came on the commission was because of the work that we put in on Prop 1B. And that was only the beginning. Um, then again, here just a bit ago, we vote. We took a vote to defund $750 million worth of projects. Mm -hmm. That's a very hard vote to take. But long comes SB1. My friend, Senator Newman, <laughs> and I spent uh, many a cocktail uh, talking about SB1. Uh, but SB1 is only is not a lifesaver. And we've got some federal money coming in. We've got to be prepared to match it. I'm hoping that um, we can use some of the uh, um, budget surplus to match and improve. Because this is just, like I said, on the, on the motion for prop, I mean, for the ATP, this is pretty much a once in a career um, opportunity for a lot of folks. Yes. And, and I hope we don't squander that, that opportunity. Um, I'm going to miss everybody. I'm probably going to come back and in a couple of meetings and harass folks <laughs> from the audience, um, <laughs> make funny noises and all the rest of the stuff that folks have done to me over the years. Hmm. Uh, but I'm really, um, I'm really thankful uh, that I had the opportunity to serve with each and every one of you. And uh, for the commissioners now, I just met today for the first time wow. in in uh, in person. So five. Actually, I mean, I, I met Leanne a long time ago, but on the commission level. So literally half of the commission um, has been installed since the last time we all sat down and met. So thank you very much. It's been a great run. I hope to see you in January. But if I don't, I want to take this opportunity to just say thank you. Thanks to everybody uh, for everything that you do every day to put people to work. Thanks. Would any commissioners like to say a few words? Uh, Commissioner Gardino? Bobby, uh, I'm speechless, and so I'll keep this short. You need to press your button, the microphone on button. I, it's on. No, it's other one. There we are. Thank you. <laughs> Bobby, I'm, I'm kind of speechless by your announcement, but, so, but I'll keep this short. I found in life, broadly defined, there's two types of people. There are talkers and takers, and there are doers and donors. And you have always been a doer and donor. Since the early days that I came on the commission and you were already here, the work that you did on the California Transportation Commission, the work that you accomplished for so many people in our state through your day job, uh, the work that you do in your community and communities throughout our state have always been something that so many of us have looked up to. Uh, I remember about a year and a half, two years ago, I called because we'd had a, a change on the commission leadership when Paul left uh, sooner than Paul von Kneidenberg left a lot sooner than any of us had anticipated and said, we need someone from Northern California to be vice chair. Would you mind being called back into service? And you asked for a couple of days to think about it with the humility that you always show and then step forward to serve once again. And you do that so well. And when you mention successes like the Caldecott Tunnel and others, there are dozens more that you have led uh, through every aspect of your work and your work on the commission and in your personal life as well. Thank you for so well articulating 
what is needed for 40 million Californians to be successful uh, in our economy, in our environment, and in our communities as well. Uh, we're all going to miss serving with you and deeply appreciate all that you do. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other calling? Uh, Commissioner Inman. Um, Madam Chair, I would like to ask for reconsideration. <laughs> <laughs> that you got to run by the big boss. <laughs> but we can only fish so many days and we love the fish fries. But um, I, I think, you know, maybe item 18, eight, item 19, you know, come on over to the goods movement sector. We've got a lot of work left to do. Bring your hammers. It's all good. Uh, seriously, um, what are we going to do when you're gone? Kind of. Maybe I'll get a class one license and I'll just pick up the truck. <laughs> I, I, I second that. So we've now moved to open. DMV is open more often so we can make that happen. But um, wow, we're going to miss you, Bobby. And thank you on behalf of every resident in the state of California because nobody has worked harder, more passionately to really make sure that we deliver every dollar, every project. So thank you Thanks. so much. Thank you. Senator Newman, I wanted to recognize you. You need to press the... I, yeah, I thought I did. Wrong button. You're on. Uh, Thank you, Madam Chair. So I, I actually, I also, I, I want to commend and salute Commissioner Alvarado, uh, not just personally, but on behalf of the entire state legislature. Uh, we are we are in your debt uh, for the work that you've done, not only as a member of this commission, but also as a leader of the Northern California Carpenters. Uh, and we're, we're, you know, grateful to have you. Uh, you will be missed, uh, but I speak for so many legislators when I say thank you, Bobby. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to, I think we're waiting to see if Commissioner Davis is able to speak uh, remotely. Um, but I wanted to say that on behalf of this commission, especially in being the voice of labor and the voice of worker safety, um, just the way that you have been able to shape SB1, but also talk about what we produce in California in terms of monumental transportation options, good paying jobs and really the, the last bastion of the middle class. I just want to thank you for always talking about that and reminding us that this isn't that these aren't just projects, that these are careers and that they mean a lot to the 350,000 plus 79,000 in the last two years that we've helped put to work. So thank you for your leadership. Thank you. Uh, okay, Commissioner Davis, we'd like to recognize Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Bobby, uh, I really do hate to see you leave. Um, I want everybody that's in the audience and everybody that's listening to the accolades that you've received today for the work you've done on the commission, um, I think is, uh, doesn't, if people can imagine, you, you actually do so much more work for the organization that you work for for your entire career. Um, your passion, your commitment to working families, um, to uh, all of the unions in the building trades in California uh, for decades have been an example for many of us to watch, uh, sort of a benchmark for most all of us to reach to. Um, and you will be missed. And I certainly hope that you're not a stranger. Uh, we would all love to see you again and again and again and uh, I just thank you for all you've done for the building trades for members of my union uh, and for all of the taxpayers in California uh, to make this state uh, the great state that it is um, the icon of the country and uh, uh, you will be remembered long and fondly my friend God bless you in your retirement and uh, I wish you nothing but good health and, and, and much much happiness thank you Thank you. <clears throat> Commissioner Tavaloni. Is this on? Yes. Well, Bobby, we knew this, or I knew this was, was coming, was looking forward to talking about this. I'm not very good at this. Um, 
And I just um, want you to know that you've been a great friend. We started out together back in the 90s on the California Licensing Board. You were chair, I was chair, you were vice chair. We had a hell of a lot of fun. We did a lot of things. You've kind of been in our family, in my family, kind of another son to me. Hmm. But I know that our friendship is just starting. I know that Ann will make damn sure that you do the right things. <laughs> and if you don't, she'll tell me about it. <laughs> and you got a problem. Oh, we best. <laughs> but I, I can only say that I have learned a lot from you in a lot of different ways. You've helped me in many ways. And we're, this commission will miss you probably, and I don't want to offend anybody else, as much or more than anyone else. Mm -hmm. You've done so much. You've helped so many people. I know you did it in, in, with, in the contractor's board, and I know you'll continue to do it. But I know for sure, which makes me feel like number one, that we'll always be friends as we've been in the past. I'm not gonna say I'm gonna miss you because I'm still gonna have you. <laughs> so, well yeah. said. so good luck and whatever you do. And I know that I'll know what you're doing and if you don't you know you'll get a spanking but uh, <laughs> all the luck in the world and and uh thanks a million for all the help you've given me and the commission for everything you've done thank you excellent uh commissioner eager here we go just very briefly on behalf of the newbies uh, that are here. This was our, our first meeting. Um, we're, we're disappointed that uh, it might be our last one together. Um, but we do want to say <clears throat> thank you uh, for paving that way for us. I know that as uh, we looked at all of the things that you have done while on this commission um, and in your work and in your life, uh, you really have been that visionary. And so on behalf of those of us who are, are coming on the commission, uh, we want to thank you. We want to thank you for paving that way for us. And we hope we make you proud in the future. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you all. And uh, we will uh, move on to, uh, reluctantly move on to item seven. Uh, and that is our presentation from CalSTA Secretary David Kim, who's going to be appearing remotely. Well, good afternoon, Chair Norton and members of the commission. Um, it is so good to see many of you gathered in person in Riverside, and I am so sorry I could not join you as well. In fact, the last in-person meeting of the commission I attended was right where you are in Riverside two years ago this month. And so to Commissioner Tavaloni, I'm so sorry to, to have missed you. I know this means a lot to you, this meeting. Um, annual meeting in Riverside. And I too would like to um, say a few words of commendation to Vice Chair Alvarado. Uh, we're just grateful for your many years of distinguished service, not only on this commission, but on the many boards and commissions on which you have served over the years. You have been uh, a public servant extraordinaire for the entire state of California, and we are grateful for your service. 
and I want to wish you all the very best of luck as you um, enter retirement and um, address uh, a health issue. We uh, wish you all the very best for continued good health and look forward to seeing you, seeing you around town. Um, I'd also like to echo the sentiments of Chair Norton in recognizing CalSTA's frontline workers and contact tracers. And the resolution that was just adopted a few moments ago commends Caltrans employees. And there's no question they are most deserving of the recognition, and I'm grateful for the Commission's actions. And at the same time, I'm so proud of the heroic contributions of employees throughout all of CalSTA's departments who have served on the front lines since the beginning of the pandemic. CHP mm -hmm. officers, DMV, field office staff, Caltrans maintenance crews, and many others. And we also cannot forget transit workers who have provided essential services throughout the pandemic. They too deserve our recognition. And as Chair Norton mentioned, I will be sending a letter thanking more than 900 employees from CalSTA and its departments who stepped up to serve as contact tracers in a time of tremendous need. Their actions helped save lives. And we would simply not be where we are today without their hard work. I am proud of each and every one of them. And the letter expresses the gratitude we all feel. Well, since we last got together uh, two months ago, much has happened, including final passage of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which was signed into law by the president. And now the heavy lifting begins in terms of implementation. Now it's being referred to as the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, and others are using the acronym IIJA. But however you choose to call it, the new law will inject billions of dollars into modernizing and transforming our nations and California's transportation system. And I believe it will set the stage for cleaner, safer, and more accessible options. And I think by now we're all familiar with the top line numbers of the new law, 1.2 trillion over five years. That includes 550 billion in new spending on transportation, water and power infrastructure and pollution cleanup, in addition to regular annual spending on infrastructure projects. As we all know, there's guaranteed formula funding across all modes. I'm sure you've seen the preliminary estimates for California, but here's a quick summary. 25.3 billion for federal aid highway apportioned programs and 4.2 billion for bridge replacement and repairs over five years. 9.45 billion over five years to improve public transportation options. 384 million over five years to help expand our EV charging network throughout the state and also the opportunity to apply for 2.5 billion in grant funding for EV charging. There are also historic levels of funding for things like broadband, airport upgrades, and power and water infrastructure. And on top of all of that, the new law creates a whole bunch of brand new discretionary grant programs and increases funding for existing discretionary programs. And I think California is in a very strong position to compete for every discretionary dollar that becomes available, and that's exactly where we are setting our sights. And so to that end, CalSTA is forming an IIJA implementation task force. It'll be made mm. up of staff from our departments, as well as stakeholders, all of whom will work together on maximizing IIJA dollars to best meet our state's transportation needs and objectives. We're also gonna be forming smaller working groups focused on specific IIJA sections with particular focus on new discretionary grant programs. The task force will hold its first meeting later this month, and I look forward to giving you future updates at upcoming CTC meetings. And I also wanna note that the Build Back Better Reconciliation Bill pending on Capitol Hill includes billions more in competitive funding for high-speed rail, transit, and reconnecting communities, and we're closely tracking, tracking this one as well. Also, while we're talking about Congress, tomorrow morning, I will be testifying before the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee's subcommittee on railroads, pipelines, and hazardous materials. The subcommittee is holding a hearing on leveraging IIJA and plans for expanding inner city passenger rail. And as part of my testimony, I plan to highlight how IIJA will support climate-friendly policies and investments that California has led the nation 
in developing. These policies are the driving force behind the 2018 California State Rail Plan, which, as you all know, lays out a long-term vision for prioritizing state investment in passenger and freight rail. Among the topics I plan to touch on in my testimony include our state's unique approach to our regional joint powers authorities, our passenger rail service expansion efforts, TIRCP, the privately financed Brightline West high-speed rail project connecting Las Vegas with Southern California, and the California high-speed rail project. And I'm gonna emphasize the point that federal rail funding for California is not just an investment, it's a partnership. And that federal funds support significant state, local, and private rail funding that, are, that have been made throughout the state and, and, and will continue for many years to come. Now the hearing will start bright and early at 7 a.m. California time, 10 a.m. East Coast time, and will be live streamed <laughs> on the TNI committee's website. So if you're up early tomorrow morning and have nothing better to do, you'll be able to catch <laughs> part of the hearing before day two of the CTC meeting. Let me now turn to something we've been discussing extensively over the past couple, many months, and that is the supply chain. You may recall the October CTC meeting took place just hours after, after the White House announced an agreement with the Port of LA, along with labor and major retailers to move to 24-7 to operations. And more recently, the White House has been coordinating what's called sweeper ships to collect empty containers and alleviate congestion on port property. And on top of that, the Newsom administration has taken major steps to address supply chain disruptions in the near term, including the governor's executive order N-1921, which calls on state agencies to identify additional ways to alleviate congestion at ports. And as part of that executive order, Caltrans is, is, is issuing temporary permits for trucks transporting overweight intermodal containers on the state highway system, as well as interstates connecting ports and distribution centers. And DMV has also made strategic moves with appointments and staff to nearly double commercial drive tests in the coming months. And this is heavily weighted to have more testing availability in Southern California. And I'm happy to report that progress is being made on the ground. Last week, the White House announced a 41% reduction in long dwelling containers at the ports of LA and Long Beach. As for longer term solutions, the IIJA includes several new grant programs that will help advance freight infrastructure. And for several months, uh, I've been advocating with our congressional delegation, along with Chair Norton and Director Omar Shokin, the need for robust federal funding for port and freight infrastructure, including yes. funding for deployment of zero emission equipment at our ports. Yeah. And just in October, Governor Newsom announced a strategic partnership with the U.S. Department of Transportation to jointly develop with regional stakeholders a program of multi-billion dollar freight-related infrastructure projects. It's called an, an Emerging Projects Agreement, where U.S. DOT will provide technical assistance, expertise, and staff time to develop projects for potential entry into innovative financing programs like TIFIA and RIF. And so this is gonna help increase access to federal infrastructure credit programs. And so we're, we're adding another tool to the toolbox that could supplement federal, state, local, and private funding and financing for freight related projects. You're gonna hear much more about executive order N-1921 and the emerging projects agreement from CalSTA senior advisor, Giles Giovanassi, who will update you just this afternoon. But one thing I wanna emphasize is that this is the beginning of a process and not the end. There are several example projects we put forward in our agreement with USDOT, but it's important to note that the agreement can be amended to add or remove projects. And so we encourage stakeholders who have a serious interest in TIFIA or RIF programs to come forward We'll work with you to advance projects that will make our state's good movement system cleaner and more efficient. So there's much more to come in the months ahead. Stay tuned. Let me now turn to the Transit and Inner City Rail Capital Program, TIRCP. On November 19th, CalSTA released the final program guidelines and also a call for projects for the 2022 award cycle. And as I mentioned in October, this cycle will include 500 to 600 million of new funding for projects statewide through fiscal year 2026-27, 20, 
Of course, that's subject to adjustment based on future fund balance analysis. This month and next month, CalSTAT will be holding optional focused meetings for applicants to discuss project concepts. I will note that project applications are due on March 3rd, and CalSTAT will announce grant awards in June. And speaking of TIRCP, the new guidelines are an early example of how we are implementing the Climate Action Plan for Transportation Infrastructure by incorporating changes that are well aligned with CAPTI actions. Earlier this month, Cal, uh, CalSTA held a webinar to pro provide an update on CAPTI implementation efforts. The webinar also highlighted upcoming engagement opportunities related to implementation. For example, the road pricing work group that kicks off next week. And the webinar also touched on plans for tracking and reporting progress. Uh, there's a video of the webinar as well as presentation materials posted on the CalSTA website. So I would encourage you to check it out. Also want to say a brief word about the Caltrans efficiency report, which will be coming up uh, on, a, on an agenda item this afternoon. I'm very happy to say that Caltrans continues to exceed the $100 million savings goal required in SP1. Caltrans is now reporting 386 million in total efficiencies with 177 million counting towards the SP1 efficiency goal. Caltrans has refined the methodology to quantify these savings um, and big thanks to the CTC for providing helpful suggestions in improving that methodology. And I think it's pretty clear in the report that steady progress is being made in maximizing efficiencies, which is not only a requirement of SB1, but also something that is very important to the governor. Finally, I just want to mention, uh, since active transportation came up earlier, um, I had a chance to ride in Sic La Via this past weekend. Um, for those of you not familiar with it, uh, Sic La Via is uh, an event for bicyclists, pedestrians, skaters, uh, and, and rollerbladers, scooters, and uh, where streets are closed to vehicular traffic. On Sunday, uh, the event took place in South LA. It was an absolutely glorious event. Uh, so many people turned out, a lot of vendors there, um, and it was truly joyous, and it's a great way to bring the community together. Ciclavia has been around since 2010, and it was their 38th Ciclavia event where streets were closed, certain streets were closed. That was my first time, it will not be my last. Uh, for those of you who are in the LA area or have the ability to get there, I would strongly encourage you to, to try it. Um, it, will, it will have an impact on you. You will be impressed by it. And it is truly uh, in line with the future of transportation in California in terms of reducing vehicle miles traveled, reducing GHG, encouraging greater mode shift. I really believe that is where we are going as a state, as a country, as a world. And so with that, Madam Chair, thank you for the time and I look forward to today's meeting. Thank you so much, Secretary Kim. And we are looking forward to honoring the uh, frontline workers at CalSTA with you when we can do so when you are in person at our January meeting. So we'll be working with you and your staff on that as well. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, are there any comments from the commissioners on what was said? Okay, well, we will move on. Thank you again uh, to item eight, Caltrans Chief Deputy Director, Mike Kiever. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, good afternoon. I'm obviously uh, not Toksoma Mashakin, uh, despite the name tag, but uh, he is under the weather. And so I am standing in and, and very happy to give you our, uh, our update. Uh, before I do, though, I, I also want to recognize and thank Bob Alvarado. I, I'm sure you don't remember, Bob, but I remember my first time having to come to a commission meeting <laughs> and I had to go up in that podium and there were questions, of course, that's why you end up up in front of that podium, right? And uh, I just really appreciated the way you spoke to me. You talked to me, you had questions, but the, you, 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 uh, came across and, and, and you wanted to understand things better. And just that, that whole approach reduced uh, that, that tension that I felt there, this, hey, let's, let's share the information, let's get it out there. So anyhow, um, I just came away thinking how that's a real pro. So I really appreciate, uh, Bob, all the time that you've uh, spent uh, with the commission, but just personally, um, my thanks to you. 
Also, uh, want to thank the commission for the uh, resolution for the frontline workers. Very much uh, appreciated the recognition. Um, a number of conversations with Executive Director Weiss uh, on this, and and uh, uh, Tanisha Taylor as as well. Um, well deserved by all of our frontline workers, but appreciate uh, again the recognition from the commission. Could I have my slide deck come up or? There we go, thank you. And could I go to the next slide, please? So I, I want to recognize one other person um, on the Caltrans team, and, and that's uh, Lori Guinan. She's our deputy of administration in, in District 6, who has had a remarkable career, Caltrans, 33 year, uh, career with the state. In March of 21, when the COVID uh, vaccinations were first coming out, uh, Lori recognized our frontline workers and the particular risk that they had being, being out there and the type of work that they did. And so she reached out um, with multiple county health departments, with Fresno County uh, government operations, and facilitated a convenient vaccination clinic. And because of Lori's efforts, we were able to get 100 Caltrans field workers vaccinated um, in, in March, just as the vaccination was coming out. But Lori didn't stop there. Uh, she began personally reaching out further. And in March and May, there were additional clinics held and an additional 500 employees. So this is just in our District 6 area. We're able to get vaccinations again for our frontline uh, employees. When the COVID booster came out in uh, November, uh, she again reached out, uh, worked this time with a local pharmacy, set up a clinic for District 6 employees and their families. And we had um, 350 COVID booster shots. A number of people got their first COVID vaccination. So again, success there, as well as 100 people or so getting their, their flu shots. So Lori's extraordinary efforts, again, supporting our, our frontline workers are very much appreciated. I've, I've known and worked with Lori for, for a number of years and, and very happy to have her uh, on our team as somebody that, that, that truly cares about what she does. Next slide, please. So a few updates on uh, some of our priorities. So the safety program has been very active under the direction of our chief safety officer, Rachel Carpenter. Uh, we're working to uh, implement uh, updated safety policy, which will incorporate the safe systems approach in, in California. We're changing uh, and updating our, our planning uh, processes with the with this approach to look at different ways that we can uh, identify safety type projects, incorporating them to, into both standalone projects and into all of our, our projects, uh, making sure that we have a safety, a safety focus. We launched a pedestrian safety monitoring program in 2019. And part of this is to use the data we have um, as we have in the past, to respond to past crashes, but also use that data with some ability to interpret it and anticipate and be more systemic and proactive about the way we do our investments. And so we're working uh, to incorporate that into our, our procedures. We're also launching some, some research to help us uh, with this, uh, looking at developing the uh, safe system and, and the role in setting safe speed limits, and also uh, an evaluation of our entire program on ways that we could can incorporate the safe systems approach into our comprehensive uh, program. We'll continue to engage with our partners, with uh, federal highways, with the CHP, with the with the CTC as we go forward uh, on this. Uh, as part of our uh, adoption of our, our uh, strategic plan. Next slide, please. We've all uh, in this room taken a leadership role combat uh, 
the climate crisis, uh, multiple conversations on this already, uh, reduced gas emissions. Just wanted to share this graphic. Uh, you know, one key element of our strategy is to look at vehicle miles traveled. And this graphic is a good demonstration of the impact we're, we're seeing uh, as we're moving toward cleaner types of transportation, uh, zero emission vehicles, um, a reduction associated with that. But you also see this, this impact of vehicle miles traveled where it can undermine the efforts as the vehicle miles traveled increase. We actually aren't seeing reductions in GHG like we might. And so this is a part of the reason that we're saying that we want to uh, find uh, other ways, other alternatives, provide people choices in the way that they make their trips, provide better alternatives to driving, and doing so without sacrificing mobility and accessibility. And, and, and that's you know, part of our multimodal efforts that you know, we're all working together to move forward. But I think this wanted to share this graphic as a demonstration of, of the why be behind that. Next slide, please. So just of, of uh, reducing GHG is our commitment uh, to support multimodal transportation. Uh, and, and so we're continuing to work on our complete streets policy and it'll continue to develop. We'll be working with with the commission and with others on this. And we'll be sharing more uh, on this in, uh, you can look forward to this in future meetings. Next slide, please. As we close out 2021, uh, we wanna uh, I just talk a little bit about the actions that have come. So we've gone beyond uh, uh, putting pen to paper, we, you know, our equity statements, and we've begun to implement concrete actions as outlined in our race and equity action plan. Uh, Director Omar Shakin isn't here, but he did want me to um, uh, thank Commissioner Norton in the, uh, the event that they had with uh, uh, the Women's Opportunity to Mentor, Power and Network Group. Uh, very, very effective. A lot of uh, discussion we had after that meeting uh, powerful uh, meaning. I wasn't able to join it, but uh, was able to watch the video afterwards and, and wonderful to, to see um, the Caltrans uh, women on our Caltrans executive team. We also are looking at, at other strategies that we can you know, utilize to, to empower our, our uh, women transportation professionals. So thank you, Commissioner Noy, and I ex extend the director's thanks for joining uh, him in that event. We're also um, working on uh, a three-phased approach uh, to developing our workforce understanding, knowledge, and expertise in implicit bias. So this is new for the department and we're um, going to be rolling out uh, annual training, mandatory training for all employees to help everybody with that understanding of uh, implicit bias and uh, the way that we interact uh, with one another and understand each other. And that'll be coming out here um, this year. We've been working together uh, on our equity listening uh, sessions. So with, with the commission, with commission staff, with the uh, Cal uh, California State Transportation Agency, um, we've Kicked some of this off with the roundtable discussions that are that are ongoing, and as part of that, just I don't know how many people are familiar with this, but there was a request for additional discussion um, with our uh, unhoused population in District Four, so in the in the Oakland Bay area, and we're able to set up uh, uh, three engagement sessions. Uh, on that topic as as part of this. And so we're a number of really good ideas came out from from that engagement and we're working to follow up. but just showing that the the uh, you know as it, as we're having these uh, discussions, as we're listening, it's it's leading to good ideas that we're we're 
moving forward to to take uh, additional actions as a uh, as a part of this. We're also working on uh, our equity index is under development and should we will be using that in the future to help guide us uh, in the way that we make our investments and ensuring that we have uh, equity both in terms of the benefits and the burdens of, of transportation. And we may have mentioned this before, but our disparity study was completed. And so uh, working with the uh, federal highways on our fed, uh, federally funded projects, uh, the disadvantaged business enterprise goals were increased to 22.2%. And so we continue to make progress uh, in that area as well on, on who's doing the work for us. Next slide, please. So working with the commission, um, our programming division chief, uh, James Anderson, presented the, uh, the ITIP at the CTC's North and, and South hearings in, uh, in November. Um, you know, we have $195 million in, in new capacity and that includes $109 million in, in new projects. So 11 new projects, notable eight rail projects, one highway project, and two active transportation projects. And, and so we're seeing uh, you know, this alignment with, with CAPDI and SB743 in the way, again, that we're making our investments and uh, in order to, to move forward with our shared strategic goals. We received a number of comments from our local partners, uh, regional partners, elected officials, uh, as well as the uh, CTC commissioners and uh, CTC executive director. We thank all of you for those comments and we'll be uh, reviewing and incorporating those into the process prior to uh, finalizing the, uh, the ITIP. Next, uh, next slide, please, thank you. So Secretary Kim did a, a wonderful job talking about the uh, IIJA or the BIL or whatever you want to, the Infrastructure Bill Act. Um, so I won't go into this in, in greater depth and we do have a presentation coming on this. We're all obviously just very anxious to, to, uh, to putting these funds to work, to putting people to work through these funds, uh, well aligned with CAPTI and our strategic priorities. I'm not sure any state is as well aligned with the priorities that come out of this bill as, as California. And so looking forward to putting this money to work and competing and bringing more money back to California for these priorities. Next slide, please. And then I wanna just talk briefly about one of our projects, uh, the Saratoga Creek Bridge. And so this is, uh, 120 year old uh, bridge wonderful bridge uh, but nearing the end of its its useful lifespan it's a, a unique structure uh, certainly it's an, an example of uh, through the iaja the need for for money that to put toward our uh, bridge uh, highway investments much much needed the initial design for this bridge was a replacement of the bridge. It's, it's uh, as I said, over 100 years old and reaching the end of its, its ability to, to continue to carry on and meet its useful function. But the community, um, uh, it, it's a community asset. Uh, through that community process, uh, they asked, hey, are there other things that you can do? And so some unique uh, ideas came out of that that we were, we're, what we're going to be working on is working with a contractor, bringing a contractor on board during the design phase, so a CMGC project, and that's one of the advantages, to look at ways that we can preserve the outside of this uh, historic arch bridge and build a bridge within the bridge. Uh, and so carry the load uh, so that this, this arch doesn't have to carry the load, but it can continue to function uh, aesthetically for the community. The other benefit of this, we believe, is we'll be able to do the work faster and have less disruption to business in the area. And so another uh, focus of ours is, is how do we um, support, you know, that, that the economy through transportation, but also benefits and burdens, how do we reduce the burden of our projects when we're out there? So proud of the team for going back, working with the community, and finding innovative solutions. 
that that concludes uh, my report. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I do want to say that it was wonderful to be the uh, co-keynote for the women event. It was really quite a pleasure to be the co-keynote with um, Director Omashakin. I wanted to go back and ask you about one of your graphs, and that was the GHG and VMT graph. Uh, so could we put that back up on the screen? Um, it shows what has happened during the pandemic and after, and I wanted to ask you whether or not you attribute any of the increase in VMT to the fact that many of people during COVID were not taking air travel, but were driving instead. And also any of that increased uh, VMT to the fact that many people were telling and, and transit agencies were telling people that unless you were an essential worker, you were, you were not supposed to take transit, but to potentially take uh, your own car. And, and, and a lot of the vaccination sites were not reachable by transit. Yeah, so so the, the this graphic. Um, okay, pre-COVID. Okay. It is, but I think what your, your point is still quite valid. So what it does show is during the Great Recession, um, uh -huh. I'm sure we all still remember that, right? So we're talking about the contrast of, of, of you know, having funds, not having funds, the impacts to the economy. But uh, it, it, it does demonstrate coming back out of that. Yeah. Um, and I think you're seeing the same thing in the, in the COVID period. Certainly those that aren't using transit, those that are avoiding planes, a lot of it ended up uh, coming back as the economy recovered. And they, um, the technology has been great in, it, in finding other ways that we can have you know, digital substitution, but we're also seeing that a lot of the travel is, is returning. And this is where going back to our point, how do we provide the choices as you're mentioning whether it's transit um multimodal uh secretary kim talked about the electric bright line train yep. uh you know looking at uh, other modes uh, he also talked about the bike uh, skater you know all, all those different ways that you can uh, you can travel and give people other choices uh so that we can try to take advantage of the benefits of cleaner fuels, mm -hmm. but not offset them through through greater uh, VMT. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, are there any other? Commissioner Inman. Thank you. I think we Is it on? Yes. Okay. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. But just to uh, tie this into our listen and learn with our equity roundtables, um, our acronym soup that we're all guilty of, and we have new acronyms uh, that continue. Is it possible for us to have a glossary quick link or anything so that we could? Uh, so, Commissioner, we actually have created a glossary, and there's a link on the front of the agenda. You click so on that, that it'll take can. you to the glossary. Okay. Uh, it's one we've had for a while. We're working on trying to get some updates. We updated a little bit. We'll continue okay. to update it probably at least quarterly. Okay, maybe in our announcement we could remind folks that it's there or something too, because it's easy for all of us that we start speaking in whatever lingo we're used to and realize that not everybody uh, uses those same acronyms every day. So let's just try and even to... internally with us, we have some that are duplicate. Okay, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Mr. Kiever, for your report today. My pleasure. Uh, next, we're going to move to item nine, FHWA California Division Administrator, Vincent Mamano. <laughs> Good afternoon, commissioners and uh, Commissioner Inman. We call that job security when nobody else knows the acronyms. We're the only <laughs> ones that know them. We have to show up so we can tell them what they are. It's job security. So you're not going to get that from the Federal Highway Administration, just so you know. So, All right. In fact, I'm going to use a few now. I'm going to make up some right now just because I think it'll be fun. You're already limping, Vince. So you, be already, careful. Yeah. I got a scooter over there. I can get out of here quick. Uh, so we're calling it Bill. Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. Federal Highway Administration is calling it Bill. You'll see it called Bill. Wow. IIJA covers a lot of things. We're calling it Bill, Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, William. huh? Not William. But yeah. Not William. Not William. Just it's like Bill. naming your dog. You're welcome dog. To, yeah. Right. <laughs> Uh, so thank you, David and Michael, and uh, for covering most of my presentation today already. I <laughs> uh, just hit a couple things on the focus on that five year. That's giant that we have a five year authorizing legislation. Uh, three hundred and three billion of that overall is uh, contract authority. So that's what that's kind of that fast act stuff that we've seen in the past. The forty seven point three is actually advanced appropriations from the general fund. So that's separate. The 303 is highway trust fund and the the 47 billion is is general fund money so that's separate appropriations the way that works the it's important to to just know we we're talking a fair amount of money here uh <laughs> california in the past had getting about four billion dollars a year and and between all the different programs between discretionary and everything we're probably looking in the over six billion dollars a year category uh, so that funding hasn't, the information hasn't come out yet, the the sheets and all that information, we should be getting that within the next couple of weeks. And then our financial systems will have those things uploaded in early January. So we're looking forward to uh, implementing the bill, the bill, bill. Um, but I think <laughs> it's, uh, the other piece I want to record to point out to everybody, and I'll point back, I'll look back at the group back here too, uh, is that we are. There are several new things in this legislation, uh, and some of those new things take regu reg new regulation. Some of those things take guidance. So just because it says it's in the law doesn't mean you just get to jump because we have to. Some of those things, like I said, could, uh, use uh, regulation or involved in. We might have to change some regulation. Trying to do as much as we can with guidance uh, makes that a lot easier. We can get that out a lot quicker. Uh, but if you have any questions, feel free to call my office and ask for Paul Schneider. He's over there. <laughs> He's our deputy division administrator. I'd rather call him chief operating officer. Oh, I forgot to thank him. You all were thanking your staff, so I'm supposed to thank him. Thanks, Paul. You're the best. <laughs> uh, actually, it, it's it, Paul is a blessing uh, in our office. Uh, he's a wealth of knowledge. He's got a lot of experience in a lot of different programs. He's a lot of experience in the discretionary area. So he's worked with uh, discretionary grant programs in our headquarters. Uh, he's going to be part of the the um, uh, Secretary Kim's team that that he's putting together, or the group that he's putting together. So I look forward to implementing that all of this with everybody. Uh, Want to hit a couple of. A lot of focus on that in climate change, a lot of focus on that in equity. Uh, so you're going to see a lot of different program areas. Uh, the formula money has got resiliency, carbon reduction, very large amount of money that's going into bridges, uh, both from the coming out of the, the highway trust fund money and the advanced allocation or the advanced appropriations money out of the general fund. There was a $90 billion transfer from the general fund to the highway trust fund. I don't know if we talked earlier about uh, possibly having to meter out the payments. So we have authorizing legislation. You authorize it, then you go build the project. And as they're building the project, Caltrans or the locals will bill Federal Highway once they pay, and then we pay them back what they built. That money, it comes out of the Highway Trust Fund to pay that, wow. and the Highway Trust Fund was going down. We got a nine, $90 billion dollar transfer from the general fund to the highway trust fund so that's going to make a big difference for us for several years so we're not look not as worried about that at the moment which is yay <laughs> um some of the discretionary things there's it, like david talked about ev charging stations rural projects resiliency wildlife crossings and reconnecting communities that's a big thing um, equity you're going to hear a lot of that i think that's going to be a big player in all of the discretionary programs uh, just, just a little shout out to Caltrans. Caltrans hosted the Ashto annual meeting down in San Diego last month, I think it was. Um, and that's Ashto is is Association of State Highway Transportation Officials, and that is made up of all the DOTs around the country. So Caltrans was hosting it here, the annual meeting, and there was a lot of discussion about equity throughout all of the different venues they had all their subcommittees and every one of the subcommittees talked about equity and i sat in jumped into a bunch of the different subcommittee meetings and what was really fun to see is caltrans was leading caltrans was speaking and everybody's watching california yeah. uh, i think uh, mike you said it earlier that we are california is set up probably better than any other state in the country for 
all of the discretionary programs just because of the movement that this entire state has made towards equity um, and resiliency and all those different things. But I think the equity thing is a big piece of that. Uh, so I applaud California as a whole and where where you're sitting right now as this money is is getting ready to be spent. So let me hit just a couple other things and then I want to introduce somebody that's going to join me on our call on from a call today. So Mike talked about 22.2 percent DBE goals. That's one of the largest ones in the country. Wow. So that's participation of minority disadvantaged businesses on federal aid contracts. So that's not just the state contracts. That's local contracts too. So that is an aggressive goal. It's not, an, I, I don't want to use the word aggressive. It's the right goal. Yeah. So they did a disparity study. Everybody's going to say that's an aggressive goal. It's not an aggressive goal. It's actually the right goal. 22%. We were in the teens and now we're up to 22. When I got here back in 2008, I think we were at 2%. Um, so I, I'm very proud of where we're at as a state um, and just very impressed with the work that I know California has done um and and the different groups that are trying to help support that so we're looking for locals to be making sure their goals are reflecting this new 22 percent goal and making sure we're meeting those goals and helping these disadvantaged businesses become stronger businesses and startup businesses and help them to become to get there on their own they can graduate from that program so that's a big big piece of that Inactive obligations. Thank you, Stephen Keck and your team. Thank you, district directors. I've talked about inactive obligations. That's the money that was authorized and not spent for a year, over a year. Uh, the national goal is 2%. California came in at 1.4%. That is huge. The rest of the country yes, says thank you to California when California can carry it like that. Uh, a lot of work went into that, but that's another example of spend the money. Authorizing the project is great but spending the money is better. So authorize it and get that project moving, get its money being spent on that project because that means jobs. Money being spent means jobs. Uh, congratulations, I think we had four raise grants here in California, three capital and one planning, uh, high-speed rail, San Francisco, Oakland, and Yolo County. I think all of those got raise grants, so congratulations to them. Yeah. Uh, I wanna, I always call people who retire quitters only added jealousy so we're going to call you a quitter all this money comes in and you see where the door is he's sitting right next to the door he's like oh lots of money i gotta run away uh but bobby it's been a lot of fun i've enjoyed chatting with you you and i've had a lot of candid conversations on a lot of very difficult issues and i uh like uh mike was talking about it you you come from the heart and i think that's what's important and i that's what i see with the commission here as a whole it's something i really appreciate i i my counterparts around the country are jealous because of the relationship we have uh, but it has a lot to do with the people that you are uh and bobby you're a good example of that and i'll deny that oh shoot you're recording this aren't you oh i can't even deny this later darn it huh? And, and he brought wine one time, so maybe that might have helped that influence, might have influenced that the thing there. Um, so I want to introduce, I know you guys are going to have a discussion on federal transit funds coming up, and Ray Tellis, who is the regional administrator for the federal transit administrator, he is on the line, and uh, I've asked Ray, since you guys were talking about it, and I thank you for giving me a heads up that that, that was, you all know, just discussing that topic, so I've asked Ray to come and see if he wanted to <clears throat> Talk a little points about either the funding and, and maybe about the what's going on with transit. We'd love to hear from him, but before, could we ask uh, you a couple yes. questions? The Trade Corridor Enhancement Program, could you talk a little bit about the changes that were made there? We're very proud of the changes in, in bill. In bill. That, that um, allow for some new interesting stuff Can right you talk about i that? would love to say i could talk about it but i haven't read it all <laughs> so i'm very sorry about that but uh, uh i do know that there is a lot of uh excitement in that area so i think that's uh, a lot of opportunity that we have here in california uh so i don't have a lot of information on that yet january then. january yeah right 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 about the Office of Multimodalism? Yeah. You must be excited. Yeah, but why don't you talk? Bobby, ask me a question. All right. <laughs> yeah, the, it, so it's very exciting in Federal Highway Administration right now. We've got a lot of new programs, a lot of uh, exciting things going on, um, a lot of opportunity to fix what's out there now, a lot of, a lot of just straight up capital money and a lot of other money too. So it's kind of a good balance of a lot of different uh, programs, so we're excited about it. Any other questions for me, Joe? Don't get no, not you. 
Yes. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Not you. <laughs> Hi, thanks, Vincent. It's nice to meet you. Nice meeting um, you. So I appreciate the the presentation and some of the things that you're saying, particularly with equity. Um, there's so much going on with the state, as you mentioned, and with with <clears throat> the federal government. It's it's heartening to see, you know, that that there is now a a big focus on that. Mm -hmm. um, there's money towards this, and um, there are communities that have that are projects that are. Um, it's great that there's money maybe for planning and maybe design, but it's going to take a lot of money to construct um, structures and, and projects that will reconnect communities mm -hmm. um, that have been impacted by by our transportation right. projects. And so do you see any you know potential for sustainable funding for this? It's it's going to be huge and, and it's going to be competing with a lot of other priorities and so, and I think it's important to recognize that this is a five-year legislation, so that's a big piece of that. So we're going to see the 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 theme of not, I hate to even use it as a theme. The equity is a, a major portion of all of our programs. I know that everything I've talked about in our agency, not just our discretionary programs, but all of our programs. Um, so I think it's important to keep up with the information. Because um, I would love for all of those communities to be able to compete for all this discretionary money. Check our Federal Highway website. I uh, just check the Google machine and Google Federal Highway Administration, and there's a link on our Federal Highway Administration website that goes to the bill and a lot of the different programs. And as we have new guidance, as we have new regulation, all of those things will be posted in that website, and that'll be very helpful for local communities to, to stay on top of that. Uh, work with their district, the Caltrans districts. I know Caltrans districts are so informed in all the different areas, uh, and they know the structure. They know how the things should work. Uh, so I think that's a communication is a very big, going to be a big, big issue to to deliver all this. And collaboration is the other big, big word. I think everybody's going to need to continue to use to make sure we're working together because it, it, it that local community is going to be able to do it by themselves. I think they're going to need help. And then people should be there to help them. Got it. Push and advocacy. There you go. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. With that, I think we're ready for Ray. All right. Ray, are you on? I am. I am. Thank you, Wins, for the invitation here this afternoon. Uh, good afternoon to the commissioners. My privilege to be with you. Uh, the intent for me to, to tag on to Vince's presentation is to bring reassurance to the transit agencies that are in the audience or listening in uh, as it relates to PEPRA. Now, I know uh, Michael Pimentel from the CTA is providing you an update uh, possibly right after this uh, topic, and uh, I will stick around for that to answer any follow-on questions. Uh, before I start, I just want to say in the spirit of the BIL, the infrastructure law, that there is $108 billion. We are extremely excited for transit uh, over the five-year duration. Certainly four new programs, equities at the forefront, uh, social equity, racial equity, uh, certainly mobility, accessibility, and all those wonderful things that transit does for our communities, and we are focused on underserved communities as well. Uh, I just released this afternoon a, a transmittal to all transit agencies within Region 9 uh, as to the fact sheets for every one of our programs under the infrastructure law. Uh, with that, as it relates to PEPRA and the, the ongoing uh, issue that seems to or will delay possibly uh, pursuant to litigation and the outcome, the receipt of Federal Transit Administration funds vis-a-vis uh, -vis the application process and the grant award, uh, I want to assure the group that uh, Region 9 is processing grant applications for FTA funds in the normal circumstance, priority for the COVID-19 relief funding, uh, businesses news as usual, and we are advancing them to the Department of Labor for certification as we normally do. The Department of Labor pursuant to a state of California request for a preliminary injunction uh, could very well on a voluntary basis hold the certification until they receive a determination 
from the courts on December the 21st. That is the request by the state of California, given the sense of urgency and hardship. And so that's what I have to pass on. We are closely monitoring the, the lawsuit between the ATU and DOL. And we are also communicating with all of our transit agencies on a regular basis as and when we have information. So with that, I'm pleased to take questions now. I will stick around until Mike Michael concludes his conversation with you to answer any further questions. Thank you. Do you want to ask questions now, Commissioner, or, or wait till item 14 when we take up the totality of the item? I think we'll do that. Thank you, uh, Mr. Tellis, for making sure that you're going to stay on for the second part of this discussion. So, and I, just a comment with Ray. Ray and I work together. We work very closely together. He's our regional administrator. He's got Region 9, so it's more than just California. I am just California. Uh, our offices work very close. We're, we have joint office in Los Angeles. We have a joint federal highway, federal transit, and maritime office in Los Angeles. So uh, I, I, I appreciate Ray. I, I, when Ray got the position, I was very excited about it because I know the word collaboration that we talked about earlier. Ray is all about that. He's all about being there for their partners. Uh, and he looks at everybody as a partner and trying to help them deliver what they're trying to deliver. So uh, just wanted, if you don't know Ray, you got a good regional administrator at FTA. He's really trying to deliver and yeah. work for you. So, absolutely, he's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Madam Chair. Yes. Um, with that, we appreciate your presentation, and we look forward to taking up some of these items when we talk about item fourteen. All right. And Christmas decorations this year: reindeer training academy, astronaut training. Just so you know. And uh, Merry Christmas to all of you. Hope you all have a very safe holiday. Thank you. Nice tie. No, thank you. Yes. <laughs> uh, with that, we're going to move to item 10, Regional Agencies Moderator, Don Vatiz. Well, I think we're going to get through these quickly. Hi. Hi. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Norton, Commissioners, Senator, and guests. Could you speak a, a yes. little closer into yeah. the microphone so we can have everyone hear you? Thank you. I'm Dawn Batiste with the San Diego Association of Governments, and I'm this year's moderator for the RTPA group. Uh, first, on behalf of uh, the RTPA group, we'd like to uh, thank Commissioner Alvarado for all of his years of service uh, to the state and to this commission, and would like to wish you the best in your retirement, and um, hopefully we'll see you somewhere in the future. Um, and thank you, Commissioner Tavaloni, for the wonderful welcome back to Riverside. We're very happy uh, to have this hybrid meeting and have several of us in attendance today. So the statewide RTPA group held its regularly scheduled meeting yesterday uh, via Zoom. And uh, we once again want to uh, express our appreciation and our thank you to the collaboration with Caltrans, CalSTA, Federal Highways, and CTC staff who really regularly meet with us to discuss the transportation issues that are facing California. Uh, and we share ideas and information as transportation professionals working to deliver important plans, projects, and services. So at our meeting yesterday, we discussed uh, the following items. First, um, Tony Dang presented an abbreviated slide deck from last week's CAPI implementation webinar. And the RTPA group really appreciates this. There were some people having technical difficulties and so uh, they agreed right away to come present the abbreviated slide deck and we also really appreciate uh, that the recordings already posted online and available for those who weren't uh, able to attend it or access it live. Keith Duncan and Paul Golazuski uh, presented us with some general information on the upcoming efforts to put together working groups for California's implementation and distribution of funding in the bill and uh, informed the group that Calista will be taking the lead on the overall implementation and working groups. Paul Schneider from Federal Highways also presented some information on the funding levels and um, new programs that we expect to see. Uh, we are excited that California is poised to do fairly well in the new programs uh, and competing for additional funds for California. Uh, the RTPA group is very eager to work and take an active role and the work groups that are being put together, and we're just excited about the funding possibilities for California. 
We also had Michael Pimentel come to um, talk to, with us about the transit issues facing uh, California and many of the participants in our RTPA group uh, had provided declarations of support for California's position. And we are hopeful uh, that this will be resolved uh, soon so as not to delay any funding for California. CTC staff provided us with updates on the 2022 STIP submittals and hearing dates on the ATP guidelines development and on the upcoming SB1 workshops. The virtual visits for this cycle of ATP projects are already full, uh, well booked up, but staff did indicate that they will try to accommodate additional agencies uh, requesting visits if possible. And this really just speaks to the continued high demand for this program. So we really appreciate the funding requests that are being discussed today later on your agenda. Speaking of active transportation, we had a presentation from Susan Lindsay of Caltrans uh, with important information on shop development cycles and timeframes, who to communicate with at Caltrans and how to locate list of shop projects early in the process so that we can collaborate on complete street elements and identify partnership opportunities. At the October meeting, I mentioned that the RTPA strongly supported later dates for submitting SB1 uh, project proposals to Caltrans. And Angel Pyle came and provided us an update, uh, a new submittal date, which we greatly appreciate, uh, as well as talk to us about the next SB1 reporting cycle. So we wanna thank Caltrans for the additional time to get further into the guideline development process prior to submitting our proposals. Mark Samuelson and Robert Peterson provided local assistance updates, including federal funds use and federal inactive project rates. Um, the RTPAs have been working closely with local assistance for several years to communicate with our local agencies and to help reduce the rate of inactivity. And so we were very pleased to hear the results as, as Vince was as well. And it, it's a great way to, uh, to start off our federal fiscal year with good news. Um, we're also looking forward to the 11th cycle of the Highway Safety Improvement Program, or HSIP. And we, we wanna thank um, the, the Department and Commission for supporting the exchange of federal for state funds for that program. Um, and finally, I just wanna thank Caltrans for having worked so closely with the regional agencies to assure that no federal highway improvement program or HIP funds um, are going to be lost to California. So we work, pretty closely together to try and make sure we maximize the usage of those funds uh, so that California doesn't lose funding. And that concludes my report and I'm happy to answer any questions. Wonderful, thank you so much. Are there any questions, comments? Thank you so much for your wonderful report. We wanna to move to um, the Rural Counties Task Force Chair, Woodrow Deloria. And this is item 11 and we're on our way to item 14. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Chair Norton, this is Woodrow Deloria, Chair of the Rural Counties Task Force, Executive Director of the Eldorado County Transportation Commission. My apologies, but I have incredibly unstable internet today and won't be sharing my video. Uh, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to participate remotely, as it is um, at times challenging for many of our rural, smaller counties, uh, agencies to travel long distances to attend these, these very important meetings. Uh, Vice Chair Eldorado, thank you for your leadership on the Commission. The Rural Counties appreciate everything you have done for the state of California's transportation needs. The Rural Counties Task Force met on November 19th and discussed a wide range of issues and opportunities facing our 26 rural counties. We had a great discussion focused on implementation of Senate Bill 743, as well as the first discussion about how rural counties can contribute to the efforts across the state to focus on equity through our rural transportation planning and policy decisions. I plan to include this discussion as a standing item on our RCTF agendas not only because it's an important focus, but as is often the case, the approach to addressing equity in urban regions may not be also, um, may not also be effective in rural regions. For example, many of our, our rural counties have populations of underserved, aging, or otherwise disadvantaged Californians, but they're, they're geographically spread out and not concentrated in one neighborhood or community, as is often the case in urban areas. So we really need to better understand how to integrate equity into our rural planning and project delivery efforts in a meaningful and an effective way. As always, during our Rural Counties Task Force meetings, we received updates from many of your great CTC staff. 
They continue to go above and beyond to assist rural agencies to effectively administer transportation funding to deliver rural transportation investments across the state. Um, I want to personally thank the entire active transportation program team as they have been developing the guidance for the cycle six ATP funding round. Lori Waters and her team have met with rural counties, engaged with us often, and provided us ample opportunity to provide input and improve the active transportation program. Um, just quickly, I'd like to share that, that Lori has, has really tolerated our complaints over the last uh, number of years. The program is either too competitive or too urban centric. And I'll just say that she goes, she's done above and beyond to help us navigate this program in any way possible. And we really appreciate her patience with us. You know, when it comes down to it, the ATP is underfunded and oversubscribed. So we're really optimistic that with the new federal funding available through the IIJA and the potential general fund augmentation, the ATP investments may soon be enjoyed across all the regions of California. And we are committed to do our part to submit strong ATP project applications to secure this, this critical funding and expand active transportation in rural communities. And equally as important, Lori won't have to put up with our unfounded complaints much longer, hopefully. And finally, we are all very pleased and look forward to securing additional federal funding for our transportation investments and will commit to work with the CTC, Caltrans, FHWA to align and coordinate projects to ensure safety, mobility, economic prosperity, equity, and resiliency are all considered to maximize the greatest return on those investments made in rural regions across California. Uh, Chair, that concludes my report. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Commissioners, do you have any questions? Thank you. If not, uh, we really appreciate your report and we'll move on to item 12, the Self-Help Counties Coalition Executive Director, Keith Dunn. Thank you, uh, commissioners. I appreciate the time and I promise to be quick. I need to just take a quick opportunity to thank Director Alvarado for his service and to let him know that I am available for fishing trips at his leisure. I just will require a commitment that he will bring me back from any deep sea trips and not leave me out there in the ocean. <laughs> so, um, I thank him for his service and uh, wish him well and, and do hope to get to spend some time with you out catching some, some fish from time to time. I'll, I would like to report that the self-help counties had a successful focus on the future conference. Unfortunately, it was virtual like I am here today with you. Uh, but we plowed through and had some good topics and addressed uh, some issues I think we're going to be looking to tackle in 2022. I uh, think that the organization is looking with great anticipation at opportunities to do all we can as a state and the collective agencies to leverage the investment that the Biden administration and Congress has put forward. We think it provides a lot of great opportunities and we're gonna be having some discussions soon about how best to coordinate amongst ourselves and with the state to make sure that we're receiving that entire investment. I would like to take the opportunity to congratulate Governor Newsom and Governor Sisolak uh, on their agreement to make an investment to reduce congestion on the border. Uh, just north in San Bernardino County near Barstow. Uh, we think it's a great uh, partnership and I know that there are many looking at this opportunity throughout the state and looking forward to addressing other congestion points that impact tourism and, and goods movement as well. So congratulations to the Newsom administration, Secretary Kim for making that investment to reduce congestion at the, at the border there. It's a, it's a Nice, nice job. Um, with that, uh, looking at 2022, I said we've got a number of proposals that we can discuss later, but out of respect for our time here, I'm going to uh, be quiet and answer any questions if you have any. Thank you. Thank you so much. Commissioners, do you have any questions? Well, thank you so much for your presentation and we're glad you had such a great event and we look forward to hearing from you again in January. Uh, with that, we're going to go to the Equity Advisory Roundtable update. Sequoia. And Gerard Wright. Good afternoon. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Well, I want to thank uh, Madam Chair uh, Hillary and the CTC for the opportunity to present to you all. And I know you, all, everyone is excited to be in person for the first time in, in a long, long time. So I know it's a, a momentous occasion to uh, get everyone together, especially the holiday season is an important time to, to, uh, to acknowledge all that. So thank you all so very much. Uh, 
I'm going to talk just a, give a quick update on uh, where we are at the Equity Advisory Roundtable, and we had some great conversation uh, in October around, uh, you know, what ex accountability and effective communications uh, are between non-governmental agencies and governmental agencies to build stronger relationships. Because I think at the heart of equity and inclusion, it's about built, forming those relationships and hearing to each other, listening to each other. And I want to give a, a shout out to one of our equity uh, roundtable members, Stephanie Ramirez from AARP, for moderating a conversation around this important topic because it allows us to kind of step back and realize, wait a minute, maybe there are some opportunities here that are already in place, or what can be done that can really take, take the communications and outreach to various stakeholders and communities to the next level and do it in a way that's equitable, do it in a way that's that respects the communities that we're serving and find opportunities to do do such uh, do those things in a uh, in a, a framework. Maybe it could be SB one because there's so many projects that are being rolled out, so many opportunities for investment that you know our our tax dollars are going towards, and we need to show that we need to highlight that, but also celebrate those opportunities as well. We learned from a, a number of our uh, our equity roundtable members about opportunities where that was such success. There was uh, one of our members from San Diego uh, who highlighted a success about, you know, they they went, went in into the conversation midstream and they realized, they, at first they thought, oh, we can't get in and we may not get anywhere. But through their outreach, through their hard work, through their ability to mobilize, they were able to really see some positive change and build a lasting relationship with the local transportation board on, on a particular project that it became a win-win for all parties. So I see this as, uh, you know, see this as a way, and I think many others in our equity roundtable see this as an opportunity to moving forward as, as means to, you know, get us to that next level of uh, reducing the top-down approach that is so prevalent in so many other uh, agencies when dealing with financing money or dealing with the, you know, the money of uh, projects such as such like SB1 or the self-help counties all up and down the state who are, you know, local voters are going to the ballot box and say, hey, we're going to put uh, money where our mouths are to build the, the infrastructure on transportation or other such services to do what we need to do. So this is, uh, we saw the, the conversation as an opportunity to really move these, these pieces forward and also seeing where there are some gaps. Uh, and for example, with a lot of the conversations that have to be done virtually, we learned, well, wait a minute, there are some, some infrastructure, internet, uh, 5G inter internet infrastructure gaps that are, uh, that are there that, you know, can impact how people in the rural regions will be able, and, and even poorer regions will have access and be impacted in terms of how their, uh, how communication will be delivered and how they are being, uh, be able to participate in those uh, in those conversations, so it was a robust discussion, and we're looking forward to doing more of that and seeing what we can do with this in 2022, uh, with such ideas as SB1 and many others that could be that could be present for ourselves. Uh, but it's all about heightening the level of communication, but also respecting the communities that we're serving. So with that, I'm going to close. And if there are any other questions or comments from the uh, CTC, I, I'd love to take them. Well, thank you very much. Those were very important equity roundtable meetings and many of us commissioners were there at those meetings and learned a lot. Uh, I wanted to make sure that Sequoia Erasmus from uh, CTC got a chance to speak and then perhaps at the end we'll, we'll ask you some questions if you don't mind, Gerard. Okay, no problem. Great. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. Thanks for um, inviting me up. I actually was going to be introducing Gerard, so that's my, but it's okay. Um, I take I the really bull by the horn sometimes. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Um, but it's great uh, to be up here with you all, and thank you so much for supporting our efforts to improve equitable outcomes in transportation throughout the state. Thank you. Uh, and Sequoia, I want to pay you a compliment because I think you've been really doing a great job of pulling these meetings together and talking about how we 
spilled from the round table to the listening session. So I want to thank you for, for that. You. Uh, I had a question for Gerard and that was um, when you were talking about the accountability and effective communication, I know we talked about making sure we eliminate the alphabet soup and really try to have these uh, glossaries of terms and other things. Are there a couple of other things that really stand out to you from the round table about effective communication that you'd also like to have us take with us into the new year? I think uh, with, within our round table, I'm just going off, off memory right now because I put my notes away. But uh, from memory, a lot of it was uh, just, just some of those little things like getting rid of the acronyms, getting rid of the kind of the nerd speak of what a project is and you know <laughs> stop talking in those acronyms and actually bring it down to a level that's understandable that's relatable you don't say oh this is we're going to terminate this project here say hey we're going to end something right here it's simple little things like that that we we talked about it was wasn't touched on for a great deal but i think that's kind of the gist of where the conversation was headed and also uh an opportunity that we feel we feel kind of going into the next conversations moving forward how do we make the equity conversation more approachable more amenable to to mm -hmm. anyone and everyone because again that's an important part of equity and inclusion making sure everyone can understand it everyone can be part of the conversation and so that's that's an element that we see uh, is important to what we need to do to move forward Okay, very good point about the approachability of our dialogue and um, ending nerd speak, which is pretty funny. So, and thank you, Mr. Wright. I, I realize that I called you Gerard because we're good friends, but I want to pay respect of you being a speaker today. And with that, I want to no call on you. Sure. Um, I, I just want to say how much I have appreciated those. And I think everybody learns every time we come together. And it's really bilateral learning, we're all learning as we go. And I think an important, important message for all of us um, from our members was meeting them where they are and not expecting everybody to always come to us. And I know Mike talked about coming to the podium and how that didn't feel so cool sometimes. <laughs> I, I think we always have to be sensitive to that. Yeah and really to fit into their meeting cycles, fit into um, all of us. So we really have uh, these strong relationships uh, where we listen mm -hmm. when everybody uh, comes together and clearly we have to find uh, our path forward together. But I, I think for all of us, just really being sensitive to the fact that while some of us might think we're funny. It's not funny sometimes. And I, I think the acronym soup is the thing that really uh, hits me the most. And I, I've had to, you know, uh, learn those acronyms myself. But I think we, we're all, uh, we just always have to be sensitive to the fact that we, we need to, to continue to come together. Right. And uh, so very good points, uh, Commissioner. And I wanted to ask Sequoia if you could just remind the audience and the public about why we kept the hybrid meeting in, in terms of having additional equity for being people being able to participate and also the ways in which we're translating meetings now, which was another really important request of the roundtable. Yeah, absolutely. Um... The opportunity to be able to continue hybrid meetings means that folks can tune in from wherever they are <laughs> and um, in whatever mode that they have available to them and um, and maybe the recordings later, <laughs> which is also great. Um, and I think that that ability to communicate in many different ways just opens up the scope and the scale of people that we can talk to um, and also that recognizing that a lot of conversations also happen outside of the meetings. So um, I think that my role kind of as liaison and I'm able to sort of take some of those conversations and, and bring them back here um, is another way that we can do it even outside of the hybrid meeting uh, uh, agenda. And um, I'm sorry, your second question? The translations. Oh, yes. So 
right, we have Spanish translation happening. We have um, ASL, American Sign Language translation happening. We have YouTube um, captioning happening. Um, am I missing anything? <laughs> we, and uh, we have transcripts available of our um, equity advisory roundtable meetings. So if folks want to read the transcripts, that's available too. Um, or they can call me. <laughs> that's going to happen. And we just want to recognize that incredible progress yeah. with all of us. And it's taken staff a lot to make those happen, but that means <laughs> additional access for so many. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yes, Commissioner Martinez. Quickly, uh, and I'm going to use an acronym. Could you press your button? How about can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, fantastic. I'm going to use an acronym that I was listening to a podcast and it's love, not L-O-V-E, but L-U-V, which is listening, understanding, and validating. And mm -hmm. that comes from the Will Smith family and how they uh, nurture their children and how they communicate with their children. And it was really fascinating as I was um, listening to this podcast, I was thinking about the Equity Roundtable and I'm, uh, and I'm also reading the book, Atlas of the Heart from Bre uh, Brene Brown, uh, Dr. Brene Brown, that that book just came out. And as we talk about um, you know, uh, accountability and effective communication, a lot of times, um, um, we're not self-aware and so our emotions and our experiences in her book she uses 87 uh, different um, emotions and experiences that really validate who we are as human beings mm -hmm. and so we cannot effectively communicate or move towards equity without understanding how we feel a lot of times we talk about empathy walking in each other's shoes mm -hmm. sometimes it has to go beyond that it's just understanding that person's story and being okay with that yeah. story right and um so i would suggest and um you know welcome um you know uh, many of the staff and, and us fellow commissioners to um, you know possibly pick up that book but i wanted to um also thank gerard and 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 the equity roundtable for the work that they've been doing i've been on almost every call um, but one of the things that we haven't talked about, and I think Caltrans talked about today and the um, Federal Highways Administration, is about that percentage that we're going to try to meet with the disadvantaged small business uh, um, sector, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of times we're talking about the big infrastructure projects. How do we bring people to the table so that there's fairness? But as well, you know, those projects sometimes, you know, and we don't, we're not always 100% honest. We're talking about how this project is going to be uh, bring benefits, but sometimes there are impediments in those communities uh, specifically for example in Santa Ana with the streetcar with the OC streetcar right you have all these small businesses that are being impacted because of obviously they're trying to build um, that system but those small businesses are being impacted from you know you know customers trying to to get there um, and so how do we help those small businesses you know benefit from some some of these projects in the long term they eventually will as people start using that ridership and i wanted to use that as as an example uh, because i think as we move forward towards equity we need to look at uh, the importance of you know small business disadvantaged businesses in these local communities that are there and how can we recapture those investments not just from an infrastructure perspective but from a dollar perspective. Mm -hmm. And so I hope as you all move along in these conversations that that is brought up and, and I'm glad that the Federal Highways Administration and, and Caltrans, you know, we now have, you know, percentage that we all have to meet and even the locals, but how do we hold ourselves accountable, right? Um, and um, that uh, is a lot of work uh, ahead of us. So I do believe that if we work collectively together and we use the right language, we use the right communication and outreach, uh, we will be successful with that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Well, are there any other comments from Commissioner? Well, if not, thank you so much. And thank you so much, Mr. Wright, for your presentation today. With that, we're going to go to item 14. And that's the federal ruling blocking transit funding for California due to state pension law. And I want to make sure that uh, Director Tellis is still on the phone with us. I am, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your patience. Uh, with that, uh, Justin. Sure. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioners. Tab 14 is an informational item. Uh, Justin, would you speak clearly into the microphone? Yes, we do that. 
Uh, Michael Pimentel is executive director of the California Transit Association. He'll give an update on the recent determination by the United States Department of Labor, referenced earlier by Administrator Tellis, uh, that finds that changes to the state's pension laws make the state ineligible to receive federal transit funds. Uh, this determination affects approximately $12 billion uh, of transit funds for state agencies or agencies across the state. Uh, Mr. Pimentel will provide background on the issue as well as an update on what steps the state and transit agencies are taking to resolve the situation. So, Mr. Pimentel. Good afternoon, Mr. Pimentel. Good afternoon, Commissioners. I'm Michael Pimentel, Executive Director of the California Transit Association, representing 85 transit and rail agencies in California and more than 220 member organizations nationwide. Before I begin my presentation, of course, I want to thank the Commission for the opportunity to address you today to provide an update on the United States Department of Labor's new policy on Pepper N13C and its impact on California transit agencies. Next slide. Now, on October 28, 2021, the United States Department of Labor issued a new policy document which argues the California's Public Employees Pension Reform Act of 2013 precludes certification of federal grants under Section 13C for those transit agencies subject to its reforms. The policy further argues that PEPRA's impact on transit workers' collective bargaining rights is material and significant, even if it does not eliminate collective bargaining over pension benefits altogether or alter collective bargaining procedures. Next slide. Now, I recognize that for many of you, this is Arcana. So on background, I do want to provide some context, and that's to say that the Urban Mass Transportation Act of 1964 requires that the United States Department of Labor certify that employee protective arrangements, commonly referred to as Section 13C arrangements, be fair and equitable before federal grants can be released to a mass transit provider like California's transit agencies. Next slide. And while this requirement is in the weeds, so to speak, its impact on California transit agencies is anything but. The new policy authored by USDOL puts at risk approximately $12 billion in federal funds owed to California wow. transit agencies. And that figure is comprised of two components. One, approximately $2.5 billion in remaining federal emergency relief funds for California transit agencies that were approved by Congress in CRISA and the American Rescue Plan Act passed in 2020 and 2021 respectively and two approximately 9.5 billion dollars in newly authorized federal transit funding included in that bipartisan infrastructure investment and jobs act that we've heard a bit about today additionally this policy puts at risk competitive grants awarded to california transit agencies in previous years that still require certification and it stands to undermine california's competitiveness for newly authorized discretionary or competitive grant funds, again, that would be authorized by the IIJA. Uh, now, here I would note that USDOL would, and in fact has asserted that this policy simply returns the department to its historic position, that which was in place under the Obama administration, and that stands in contrast to the policy that was in place under the Trump administration. And here I will stipulate that that much is true. However, it is also true that the Obama administration was twice challenged in federal court on the legality of their policy and law. In a rebuke of USDOL, the United States District Court Judge Kimberly Mueller, herself an Obama appointee, ruled in 2014 that there is nothing in federal labor policy which expressly forecloses all state regulatory power with respect to those issues such as pension plans that may be subject to collective bargaining. And in a second ruling issued after USDOL refused to abide by her first ruling, Judge Mueller further argued in 2018 that USDOL's policy could not be supported by its interpretation of Section 13C or legislative history and found that the state had prevailed on all issues in joining ultimately USDOL from relying on PEPRA to deny certification of trans grants for California transit agencies. And so it's with that context that you may be asking yourself, well, how could this happen again? And as we turn to the next slide, I will note for you that in 2019, after the Trump administration conformed its policy on certification to the court's ruling, ATU 
that would be the Amalgamated Transit Union, filed a PEPRA-based lawsuit against the department, seeking them the revocation of the certification of grants certified pursuant to that policy, and ultimately also enjoyment against USDOL from further certification. The lawsuit asserted that the court's previous rulings were intended only to prevent USDOL from relying on PEPRA to deny certification of grants to two agencies, Sacramento Regional Transit District and Monterey Salinas Transit. Those two agencies were party to the initial rounds of litigation. Next slide. Next slide. So for more than a year, the litigation proceeded in court and resolution was expected in September 21, directly following a hearing for summary judgment originally scheduled for May of this year. But with the change in presidential administrations, we saw USDOL request a delay in the hearing schedule, signaling to the court that it intended to change its policy on certification, which as we've discussed was released on October 28th. And as we talk about the state's response and next steps, it's important to note that the path forward ultimately lies again with Judge Mueller. And as a reminder, she was the judge who, who ruled in the previous rounds of litigation. And that's because we are before her again today, awaiting her ruling on a motion to state implementation of USDOL's October 28th policy and on a cross complaint filed by the state of California, which looks to address this matter in its totality. These legal avenues, to be clear, are an outgrowth of ATU's 2019 litigation. Now, as an association, we helped coordinate support for the state's motion to stay by securing declarations and support. Those would be formal court filings from member agencies, including BART, Golden Gate Bridge Highway and Transportation District, LA Metro, Orange County Transportation Authority, and the Santa Clara Valley Transportation Authority. The state also secured declarations and support from the California State Transportation Agency, ARB, and Caltrans. Now, as Don with the RTPA group noted, we also helped coordinate letters. These were addressed directly to Secretary um, Marty Walsh and Secretary Pete Buttigieg, uh, attesting to the regional impacts of USDOL's new policy from regional agencies within my membership, including MTC, SCAG, and SACOG. And I would note that the SCAG letter was co-signed by OCTA, RCTC, SBCTA, ICTC, Metrolink, BCTC, and LA Metro. Next slide. Yeah. Now, given Judge Mueller's previous decisive ruling on this matter, we would say that we're extremely bullish that she will rule again in California's favor. And the timeline for her ruling on the state's motion to stay is still to be determined, but expected as soon as December 21st. And for your awareness, and this was acknowledged by Regional Administrator Ray Tellis, USDOL has signaled that it would, will neither certify nor deny certification owed to California transit agencies through December 21st. And if that motion to stay is ultimately granted by the court, federal funds would again begin to flow to California transit agencies, at least temporarily. That would be until the court rules on the state's cross complaint. Now, the state has requested that the court rule on that cross complaint in quarter one, 2022, and we are waiting for the court to concur in that schedule. And it's with that that I will conclude my prepared remarks uh, and welcome any questions from the commission. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I wanted to thank you for your presentation, Mr. Pimentel, and then also ask if um, Administrator Tellis had anything to add to what was just presented. Mr. Tellis? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I do not have anything to add. That was a comprehensive presentation. Uh, so short answer, no, I do not have anything to add. Okay. So, uh, Mr. Pimentel, I guess the big question is, it, depending on what happens on the 21st, where are we in terms of the applications and, and the funding that is being held up that you said that the 12 billion that we have that are hanging in the balance. Can you tell us what happens yeah. either either way on, on the 21st? Yeah, I, I think the most immediate impact, the one that we're most concerned about is access is, to the federal emergency relief funds that were approved by Congress. Uh, here we noted there's $2.5 billion that agencies have yet to draw down. 
Uh, and in recent months, we have seen regional entities which receive the monies from the federal government begin to identify the sub-allocation amounts that would go to individual agencies. And so agencies are actively applying for those funds. Uh, in fact, right before the determination was issued by USDOL, we did see the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, that being in the San Francisco Bay Area, issue a new split letter that spoke to the allocations for those individual agencies. And so as agencies move forward with their grant applications, as regional administrator Tellus noted, FTA, FTA will be processing those to USDOL, and it's at that time that USDOL will be contemplating how they proceed with uh, the release of those funds through certification. And so we do see action on December 21st that is positive in the state's uh, direction, uh, ultimately granting that motion to stay. Those monies can again begin to flow to California agencies. And here I want to acknowledge that there is uh, quite a lot of variability in the immediacy of the need for those funds across California transit agencies. For some, the need is imminent, and it is something that is providing them with the support that they need to continue to provide uh, service and that is needed in the very short term. For other agencies in the state, there is a bit of lag time before those monies will need to be drawn down on again uh, because they've taken receipt of funds in recent rounds of, of funds, uh, of, of fund allocation. And so that would be, again, the most immediate impact as we look at that $9.5 billion, which ultimately comprises that, that larger portion of the $12 billion that we outlined. I would note for you that that $9.5 billion is reflective of the full amount of funding that was approved in the IIJA for California and that would flow to California via formula. The more immediate impact would be $1.8 billion, which would be released to California in fiscal year 2022. Okay, thank you so much. Um, commissioners, do you have any other questions? Uh, Commissioner Falcon? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I hope I don't sound petty by asking this question and without understanding the details of um, you know the the issue at hand are there other states to your knowledge um, Mr. Pimentel uh, that is in the same situation where their funding is being potentially blocked my, my understanding is currently no uh, and again the unique circumstance that we find ourselves in is the direct outgrowth of uh, policy state law that was passed in 2012, the California Public, em Pu Public Employees Pension Reform Act of 2013. Uh, and it's with that that there is a foothold uh, for USDOL to contemplate uh, holding on certification for California transit grants. Okay. Um, just what is the, and I hate to ask this, but let's say December 21st doesn't go our way. What is What scenarios are we looking at? So I think if the motion to if the motion to say ultimately does not go away, there are opportunities to appeal uh, that decision to a higher court. Uh, I would say that at this stage, because we have seen two decisive court rulings from the exact same judge arguing over the exact same matters, again, we're fairly confident that uh, that motion to say will be granted. There are a variety of um, considerations that the court must contemplate in authorizing a motion to stay. And primarily, it is a focus on the direct harm uh, that would um, materialize for a party. Here in the state of California, we have uh, argued of the significant impacts uh, by way of scaled back transit service, canceled or delayed transit projects that we feel confident meets that uh, primary consideration. Uh, but also, too, um, we are uh, needing to speak to our ability to prevail on uh, this larger question that is asked about the leg legality of allowing uh, grants to continue to flow to California. Uh, and there we do think that precedent uh, from the, again, the exact same court uh, is on our side. And so uh, there are opportunities to uh, appeal. Uh, at this point, we've not engaged thoroughly in conversations of what those next steps would be uh, because we are confident on that December 21st date. Uh, but of course, uh, if that were not to go our way, uh, we would have uh, opportunities to continue to discuss uh, with the California Department of Justice opportunities for engaging in other ways uh, to ultimately uh, have some success in this area. Okay, thank you for that. And, and thank you, Madam Chair, those are my questions for now. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Commissioner Martinez. Sir, very quickly, um, nothing for Mr. You need to hit your mic button. Uh, yeah. 
Thon? Okay, yep. here it is. I need to get closer. Just very quick question, maybe for uh, yourself, Madam Chair, or staff, as we move into the on um, December 21st, uh, I did see other um, state agencies uh, submit a, uh, a a declaration of support. Uh, what's the position of us as commissioners lending a uh, our, our support and and or uh, the CTC just in general? I don't know what that process would be, but since we did, did see CalSTA, our ARB and Caltrans, mm -hmm. is it possible for us uh, or you, Madam Chair, um, to write a letter in support on behalf of the commission or CTC? Uh, that's a wonderful question, Commissioner Martinez, and uh, we'll ask uh, Executive Director Mitch Weiss about that. Are, are we able to submit a letter on behalf of the CTC? <laughs> We're able to do whatever you would like. Uh, so let me, but let me put some, some, uh, frame that a little bit. Uh, we, we can't take action on this item because it is not noticed as an action item. However, our uh, operating procedures allow us to send a letter uh, upon my consultation with the chair and the vice chair. And, you know, of course, this is not an action item, but I don't see anyone shaking their head no or looking at, like they're going to be <laughs> mad at me if we send a letter. So mm -hmm. I, I, I think we're, we're probably OK in, in trying to put something together quickly. So yes, it is within our purview, and yes, we will be having that discussion to send a letter in the same manner as you see the other agencies. Great. Thank you very much for raising that. Commissioner Inman. Um, I have a question. During COVID, our ridership dropped off, but what stayed with us were those transit-dependent folks who really didn't have a lot of other options. So what funding do we have available so that we don't have service levels cut so that our transit-dependent folks are left stranded? Mitch, do you want to take that, and then we'll also talk to Pimentel? Well, I'd like to give it to Mr. Pimentel, uh, but <laughs> I, I will say that the commission does not have funding under its purview that can be used for transit operations. So, uh, Mr. Pimentel, if you could talk about what hap what's our uh, ability as a state, what would we be doing in that fail-safe challenge uh, if, if this did not go our way, no transit operations? Yeah, I I would say on that front, we have not had advanced conversations with the administration or the legislature in terms of what funds could be made available to support transit agencies if the federal funds were not forthcoming. I would just signal to you that during the height of the pandemic, and this is the subject of several briefings I provided to the commission uh, during the pandemic, we did see, uh, as Commissioner In Inman noted, significant drop-offs in uh, ridership for our public transit systems. We did also see for a period of time significant declines in the sales tax revenue that often uh, helps support transit service. And so in the absence of federal funds, I think we are as a state going to be incredibly challenged to continue to provide the transit service that's necessary for supporting um, those who are transit dependent, uh, those who rely on, on public transit as a means not just of mobility but as economic opportunity. And so it's it's with that as context that you know we as a state have been resolute in our position on the importance of these of these funds. And I think it's also why we've seen the state of California through Governor Newsom and his letter to Secretary Walsh speak so decisively about the importance of these funds continuing to flow and why we've had such a strong assist from our two US senators, Senators Feinstein and Padilla, because they do recognize the amount of discord and, and disruption that could result. Uh, from these funds not flowing. And so, again, I wouldn't want to get ahead of where the administration or the legislature might be uh, thinking in terms of additional support, uh, but I would just note for you that if the federal funds are not, not forthcoming, agencies across the state will have significant funding shortfalls uh, that would be uh, hard for really anybody absent the federal government to paper over. Uh, Commissioner Inman has a follow-up comment, and then I'd like to actually go back to Administrator, tell us uh, on this issue as well. Go ahead. Well, since we don't have any funds available, resources, I was hoping maybe Senator Newman could ride point on this and see, since he might have access to some other funding. I, uh, Commissioner, I'll gladly do that to whatever extent I can. But uh, glad to follow up on that. Good. Thank you, um, Administrator. Tell us, do you want to? Can you give us some idea of what could happen if 
December 21st did not go our way yet. We still have people who are essential workers operating in um, pandemic situations that need uh, transit operation dollars. What, what's the next step? Well, I think what we have done is tried to canvas the transit agencies, um, certainly in coordination with Michael to some extent, as to the hardship over a duration of time. So if it were delayed 60 days, what's the hardship? If it's 90 and then longer term. And I think in the short term, it's the smaller agencies that are impacted. And, uh, and then more so everyone in the long term. So 90 days might not be a factor. It is somewhat of a concern that these funding were really intended to prevent layoffs and, and terminations and, and you know things like that in terms of transit workers. The other thing we've uh, thought to ask transit agencies is, have you spoken to your unions to see whether they would object uh, when the intent of the COVID-19 funding not only being immediate, but certainly to prevent layoffs and furloughs. And uh, that response is not being conclusive. Some have said yes, some have said they'll write a letter to, to get support from the union. There are also transit agencies across California that are PEPRA exempt. City charters and county charters uh, certainly um, make it so. And there are other large agencies, such as San Francisco Muni. Um, uh, Michael mentioned the two exempt units because of litigation, SACRT and MST. But there are others that are PEPRA exempt. So in that case, uh, DOL is expected to certify. Uh, that's the best answer I can give you at this time. I think long term, Michael has talked about the hardships, uh, both in terms of uh, by the way, the COVID-19 funding is for operating assistance. And we would hope at some point the unions might not object from, uh, on that as strongly as, as capital funding um, going long. Thank you very much. I appreciate that detailed answer. Um, yeah. Justin, I just wanted to ask if we had any public comment on this item. Chair Norton, I have no attendees indicating they wish to make public comment at this time. Okay, all right. Well, with no other comments, and we thank you all, commissioners, for your comments and, and the comments of the presenters, um, we are going to uh, end this item, and we are going to take a brief break. It is now uh, 3.38, and we're going to come back at 3.50. Thank you very much. Cool.